Okay, we're going to get started here uh, fairly soon. I think we're looking for maybe another 100 people to come in, uh, filing in, so I think we've got plenty of seats. We're supposed to start at 2 o'clock, uh, and I, I think we'll, we'll get there relatively uh, on time, not for television time, but I think enough for Washington conference time. I think we'll be, I think we'll be fine. Um, I am rambling for just another second, assuming that we don't need to do mic checks and that we're okay. See lots of friendly faces in, in the audience, in the room. Um, so let's start. My name is Mark Lloyd. I'm uh, the director of the Media Policy Initiative at the New America Foundation. We are very, very proud to be able to uh, put this program together in association with uh, the University of Southern California Annenberg program. Um, this is uh, an issue of great importance, I think, to me and also to our nation. Uh, we are not taking a position on this one way or the other, and uh, we really do hope to have a nice, lively conversation, uh, civil conversation. We've got some very smart people on the panel. Uh, and I will let the, our moderator uh, introduce them. Um, and I just wanted to say you know, part of what happens with these programs is that the audience is rarely recognized for the important part that we play. But this would be a very different program if none of you showed up. So thank you very much for showing up. Cold, snowy day in Washington, and I got a call at I think 6 o'clock in the morning from the German school telling me not to worry about my children going to school. But, but I don't have any German children going to the German school. I don't, I'm not quite sure what that was about. Uh, but I, 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 think, I think they are set. Um, again, thank you very much for being here. This is a program on media ownership and the public interest. Um, we did invite Chairman uh, Janikowski to be here. I understand that he is uh, either traveling to Davos or maybe even in Davos at this period of time. We do think this is a very important program. We've had some interest from a few members of Congress to come and speak. We understand that occasionally they get busy doing other things. And if they come in at some point in time, we will try to provide some opportunity for them to step up to the microphone. Um, so the program may change a little bit as we, as we move along. Uh, we want to try to preserve as much time at the end as possible for some question and answers, uh, and so very much hope to do that. And uh, given that, let me make my remarks short. That's it. Uh, let me introduce a friend and mentor of mine. Um, I think it was uh, almost... Uh, God, 15 plus years ago um, that Wade Henderson said communications policy is a civil rights issue. Wade was and is leading an organization, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, that is a combination, a coalition of a broad range of civil rights organizations, um, including unions, uh, church organizations, uh, women's groups, minority groups, a wide variety of organizations uh, working on uh, equal justice under law for all Americans. Uh, Wade has been a friend and a mentor to me and, uh, and has expressed some views, not so much about, I think, um, uh, you know, the final determination, which we don't know yet at the FCC, but about the importance of taking the interests of uh, all of Americans into account as uh, these decisions are made. Uh, without stealing too much of his thunder, let me introduce Wade Henderson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Mark, thanks for that introduction, great introduction. I also want to thank our friends at the museum uh, for allowing us to use the night studio for this very important program. So they're very gracious. Thank you for that. As Mark said, I'm Wade Henderson. I'm president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. The Leadership Conference is the nation's premier civil and human rights coalition with more than 200 national organizations 
working to build an America that's as good as its ideals. I want to thank Mark, the USC Annenberg Center on Communications, Leadership, and Policy, and the New America Foundation's Media Policy Initiative for inviting me to be with you here today as we discuss our vision of how bringing more diversity to media ownership impacts the public interest and the key role that the Federal Communications Commission plays in shaping that vision. Today's event about media ownership and the public interest is critically important because it goes to the heart of American democracy in the 21st century. The 21st century is the age of information. We are inundated daily with media, so much so that we have a hard time not looking at our cell phones, smartphones, and tablets every 10 seconds. As such, who owns and controls what information we get via our cell phones and via traditional platforms like television and radio are central to a conversation about the very health of our democracy. As James Madison once said, and I quote, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. And yet the FCC is failing to carry out its responsibility to ensure that communication in America remains an essentially democratic, open opportunity for all. The racial and gender disparities in media, in media ownership that date all the way back to the beginning of the civil and human rights movement are well within the powers of the FCC to address, but that is not happening. Women, more than half the population, own less than 7% of broadcast TV stations. And rapidly growing minority communities are even farther behind. Hispanics hold less than 3% of these licenses. And Native Americans, African Americans, and Asian Americans all have less than 1%. These disparities are not an accident. They date back to the era when most broadcast licenses were awarded in a flagrantly discriminatory manner, an era when many people of color could not vote and women could not even obtain department store credit cards in their own names, let alone full power broadcast station licenses. Over the years, the few media conglomerates that received these licenses created huge empires by gobbling up local independent outlets so they could homogenize and recycle programming, slash news budgets, and virtually stamp out local input. Now that they've maxed out of the legal limit, they want these limits raised, uh, the effect of which uh, will be to continue to keep licenses out of the hands of a new, more diverse ownership. We in the civil and human rights community care about media ownership because the way the public looks at issues, indeed whether the public is even aware of issues like voter discrimination, immigration reform, or fair housing, is directly related to the way these issues are covered by the media. The way the media covers issues is directly related to who the reporters and producers and anchors are. In other words, who is actually employed by the media? Who is employed by the media is directly related to who owns the media. And who owns the media is directly related to public policies that determine who gets a federal license to operate and who does not. Now this media landscape has led to a distorted view of our nation that reinforces stereotypes and misinformation over facts. The same media that trumpets demographic gains of minorities struggles to paint accurate depictions of them. Studies have shown that media suggest to all Americans that African Americans are less likely to be doctors, Latinos are more likely to be gardeners, and Asian American men are either nerds or kung fu masters. Correcting this disparity in ownership is squarely within the powers and responsibilities of the FCC, which began talking about the problem 35 years ago, but has consistently failed to address uh, the matter in a significant way. 
Now, time and time again, the civil and human rights community has asked the FCC to do the research, to understand the needs of all Americans, and specifically to do the research to understand the impact its rules have on opportunities for more diverse ownership. And we're still waiting. And now, instead of promoting diversity in media ownership, the FCC is now preparing to vote for an order that would increase consolidation, thus making it even harder for women and people of color to catch up. Now, the media conglomerates themselves personify an ironic truth. While their newsrooms are declaring that demographic change will require institutions to diversify, their boardrooms are fighting tooth and nail to remain as homogenous as ever. And unfortunately, the FCC seems to be siding with homogeneity in the boardroom. Today's event presents an important opportunity to highlight the issue of media diversity because of what is really at stake, equal opportunity and equal access to communication, as well as the very health and well-being of American democracy. The demographic shifts are real for our country. They're real for business. They're real for politics. It's time for the FCC to recognize that they're also real for the media. And thank you so much for being listeners and being here today. I now have the privilege of introducing the moderator for today's panel. It's my pleasure to introduce Adam Clayton Powell III, Senior Fellow of the USC School, the Annenberg School of Communications. Please join me in welcome him, welcoming him to the event. Adam. Thank you, Wade. And uh, just before the program began, uh, he and I were talking. We realized we met 40 years ago in the Supreme Court. Uh, so I hope that uh, our paths cross again before 2053. Um, <laughs> Uh, and thanks also to Mark Lloyd for uh, his uh, hard work putting this program together. Um, I should, uh, disclosure, I was on vacation until a few days ago, so uh, you know who really did the work. Um, Mark also um, uh, neglected to mention that uh, he is going to be um, having a formal tie with the University of Southern California. He'll be joining the USC Annenberg School later this year uh, as a faculty member. He'll be uh, uh, running a, uh, academic programs here in Washington and. Uh, as always, making a difference. Uh, our, our panel, uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, there you'll see uh, their biographies in your packets. So I'll be very brief and just introduce them quickly by title. From your left to right, uh, Craig Guerin, president of Free Press, who has written and spoken about these issues uh, uh, for years. Uh, Bernie Lunzer, who was elected in 2008 the president of the Newspaper Guild. So um, uh, he was elected just as the recession hit. So um, he, he knows what a fight is. Um, Jane Mego has been uh, also in uh, fights in courts in what, five different circuits, I think? A whole lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> She's the executive vice president of legal and regulatory, regulatory affairs and the general counsel of the National Association of Broadcasters. And Steve Waldman, who is now a visiting senior media policy scholar at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Steve, let's begin with you, uh, because before you went to Columbia, you were the senior advisor to the chairman of the FCC. So I think you may have some insights on what uh, he's up to and, and why. Uh, well, first I have to say I'm not going to be lip syncing my comments uh, today, uh, in, including uh, from Chairman Janikowski. Um, the, uh, the FCC can speak for itself about uh, what, what they want to do. But I do want to put this in, in a broader context. Uh, when we talk about public interest and policy that affects public interest, uh, Wade Henderson talked about one really key element of that, which is minority ownership. Uh, but it's not the only element of discussing public interest. And I think we, the important context for this discussion, or one of them, is that we are in a crisis of local accountability journalism. Newspapers are contracting dramatically, uh, and the effects on local communities are severe. Bernie was just saying that the, the uh, head count at the Baltimore Sun is now under 100. It used to be 400. Uh, nationally, we now have about as many reporters as we had before Watergate. 
News magazines have cut staff in half. Network news have cut staff in half. Uh, when we looked at a particular example in Raleigh-Durham, uh, where the, they had cut the newsroom in half as well, and we said, well, wh what does that mean? Why does that matter? Where, who got cut? Well, the beats that got cut were courts, schools, hospitals, uh, issues of really profound importance to um, American uh, communities. Uh, and so I think that that is the context that we have to look at this whole debate. Uh, and by the way, the populations that are most hit by these cutbacks are low-income populations. Upper-income populations are going to find the information that they need. We can see that you know, WallStreetJournal.com and FinancialTimes.com and many different business models related to personal finance are doing fine. It is the accountability journalism that is really dealing with problems in the core guts of municipal government and state houses. Georgia, state house, used to have 15 people covering the state house, now it has five. So you see this across the board. People are, are the watchdog function of journalism is eroding. So what can you do about that? First of all, I think that you have to start with the right diagnosis of what caused this. Now, I think as sort of a, perhaps a premise among some here is that the cause of that is media consolidation. And I disagree. I think media consolidation may have exacerbated it, but I would say the cause of it is the internet. And the fact that readers and advertisers have other places to peddle their wares and get their news. Uh, it, it wasn't Rupert Murdoch who created Craigslist and caused uh, classified advertising to drop by 70%. Uh, so if you start with that uh, assumption that this is a you know, seismic shift <coughs> resulting from digital media, um, it leads to di in different directions to, for media policy. My personal view is that the media policy, both at the FCC and in Congress, ought to ask a question, which is that will, this meet, will a potential merger that's being proposed increase the investment in local news and local content, including from minority media startups, or will it not? And I would do that, you could do that either through the waiver system, or I would suggest Congress consider something even more dramatic, which is to say, instead of this system that we've had operated under in the past, we allow for the possibility of a wide variety of different mergers, but only if they pay a transaction fee on the merger, which would go to create an endowment in each community that would help subsidize uh, local, uh, local media. So I, I, you know, that's just one idea, but I think the really the key point is that in addition to the minority ownership issues, we need to look at the context of the broader collapse of journalism and try to think creatively about media policy in a way that could actually help with that problem. Bernie, you're, you're nodding. Uh, you approve of uh, what Steve's suggesting? Well, uh, you know, in the current situation, uh, we need innovation, and I, I think it's great that uh, Steve talked about ideas for innovation because uh, for me the question about this current uh, shift, potential shift in policy is, you know, will it fix anything? Will it solve anything? And uh, it's, it's my concern from a guild point of view, practitioners were, uh, were there in the field and we've seen our newsrooms cut by half, by a third, like the Baltimore Sun by a fourth. Um, we do have people in broadcast as well, and we've been working on websites since 1995. We're looking for that kind of innovation. We've tried to build co-ops. Uh, we've got one employee stock ownership uh, in, in place in Portland, Maine. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is not enough thinking about new ideas. This current idea seems to me it, it increases the value of the current properties, but it's not, it's not going to add to any employment. It's not going to bring anything back to communities. Um, it may actually stifle innovation. It, it, my concern is that uh, we not do policy that actually makes things worse, and, and that's my concern here. I would love to see a number of these uh, venerable mastheads that, uh, where there are legitimate problems, whatever, whoever you want to point at, whether it's the internet or uh, other forces, and we know the, the web is uh, the primary uh, factor, but the economy and uh, paying too much for some of the uh, properties has also contributed. Uh, but, but in effect, we need innovation, real innovation, and I think that in many respects, uh, possibly getting these, especially print products that are now both print and web products, 
tying them back to the community, whether it be through universities, uh, through uh, consortiums with uh, public broadcasting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that around the edges. We're seeing things like MinPost, Voice of San Diego, uh, The Bay Citizen, uh, different projects where uh, things are coming together, and, and we think that's great. Uh, so it, it, if people said to me, is this a great course, what the FCC, what they're proposing, is this going to really fix the problem? Not really. Uh, and, and, and it could potentially make it worse, at least for a time. That's my thought. Jane, you think it'll make it worse? Interestingly, I think that uh, an awful lot of us, we agree on a number of principles here. Uh, and I think what we're disagreeing on is the way you go about doing it. And just starting from what Bernie just said a moment ago, I think that uh, you have to define what the this is. You know, what is it that the FCC is doing? And I think that one of the things they're doing, and it's based somewhat on a report that Steve did uh, more than a year ago, is to look at the market and say, look, there are some natural synergies that can happen that actually do make a difference and do increase uh, some of the innovation and increase the ability to provide news in the markets. Uh, we found that when you can have uh, some efficiencies that are brought out in the market, sometimes in the case of a TV duopoly, sometimes in the cases in the studies have looked at where there are some grandfathered situations where there's newspaper and broadcast outlets, that in fact you do have more news that's serving uh, the local community that's addressed. They're able to use the, the reporters uh, in, in multiple ways, and that's something that helps. And the, the this, uh, according to the reports that the commission is thinking about right now, are things like s uh, relaxing slightly the uh, newspaper uh, broadcast ownership ban, uh, not dealing with, uh, not taking it all away from television, but uh, there's some, some potential waivers that might happen in the television world looking at uh, the radio industry, which is very much in a, a hurting situation, and you know, a local radio, uh, a news talk radio station being able to work with the, the local newspaper, I would think, would be a, a, a real benefit. And so it seems to me that the, the kinds of things, that the this that we're talking about is not uh, against innovation, it's for innovation. I think it's also for uh, some to promote some of the minority ownership and the minority interests that are involved because I think a stronger broadcast industry is something that can be uh, an opportunity for everybody. One of the things that we noticed in uh, the recent uh, reports that the commission came out in the, um, the 3 through 3 reports, 3 through 2 areas of form that the commission has, and they were looking at trends in, uh, in, in, in broadcast ownership. And one of the things that uh, we, we were able to see in that is that some of the positional interests in some of these companies uh, have been, uh, there's been a significant increase in the number of women and minorities that have been moving up in the uh, officer and uh, some of the, the positions uh, within the companies. And I think that leads to uh, more ownership and more, uh, more ability to get into the industry as long as you've got access to capital. That's where you get back to Steve's points. I'll stop here for a minute. I can go on for a long time, but it's, uh, I, I, I don't think, my, my bottom line here is that the, uh, the, the evil that I think people see is ascribed mostly to, uh, many times to things that we're not really sure are, are real. And we ought to take a careful examination of that before jumping to those conclusions. And, and the this we're talking about is top 20 markets right now? Well, just to, let's, so yeah. we are all are operating from right. the same set of facts. <laughs> yeah, right, that's a good thing. About, uh, because cause I think, you know, f f Free Press has referred to this as the gutting of the, of the media ownership rules. The industry asked mm -hmm. for, uh, the industry asked for an elimination or a dramatic relaxation of the broadcast limits which my understanding is the FCC has basically said no on that. They asked for broad relaxation of the radio rules in the industry, and the FCC has basically said no on that. They asked for relaxation on the network rules, and they basically have said no about that. So where they are relaxing is one is, uh, or at least based on the reports so far, is allowing for cross-ownership between newspapers and radio. So, uh, which I think is maybe a good thing. If you have CBS wants to go in and compete with Citadel or Clear Channel and create some local news channels, that might be a good thing. And then on cross ownership, uh, the, the reports are that they're keeping markets 21 to 220 or whatever we're up to the same, and they're considering relaxation in the top 20. So that's really what we're talking about is, uh, and as I understand it, the, the proposal is that for the top 20, they might allow a merger between a newspaper 
and a TV station that is number five or worse in the ratings in the top 20 markets if allowing that merger still allowed for eight voices to exist. Am I getting that right? Somewhere in that range. It's a, it's that's a waiver test. So that's five, five or worse, meaning not ABC, CBS, NBC, or Fox. Right. Precisely. Okay. Depends on the ratings. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Okay. And so you're okay. saying this is the so uh, let me evil incarnate. <laughs> yes, I will take the position that evil is afoot. Um, <laughs> Look, Come on. <laughs> we, we can look at what's happened to the news industry, and, we can, and the internet has something to do with it? Absolutely. Does the economic downturn have something to do with it? Absolutely. But I think we can also say that a lot of the worst things that have happened in the media industry have been self-inflicted wounds. And the FCC has looked the other way for decades and allowed consolidation and concentration again and again and again. And every time we're told it's just a little tweak, it's just a little change, this isn't a big deal, the market is changing, and the results again and again and again are tens of thousands of working journalists losing their jobs. Uh, we're seeing the number of m minority owners, diverse owners, dropping. Uh, and, and so I think continued relaxation, more media consolidation is a big deal. This, what the FCC is proposing would allow somebody like our friend Rupert Murdoch, owner of News Corp, uh, someone who's come under a lot of attention over in England for the activities of his empire, to buy the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Tribune, because his TV stations are outside of the top four, at least some of the time. Uh, I think that's a big deal. Uh, I also think it's a big deal that you can look at the history of this media consolidation, that every time the FCC moves to do it, the public opposes it. So there might be some lobbyists that think it's a good idea, but 99% of the public comments on the record say no more media consolidation. And that's happened in 2003, it happened again in 2007, it's happening again in this round. Every time the FCC makes this move, Congress opposes it. The Senate has voted several times to overturn these rules. Uh, the courts oppose it. The FCC has now gone to court twice and lost the case because they didn't consider what the public had to say and because they didn't consider diversity and these rules have thrown out. And yet here we are again uh, in Barack Obama's America just days after uh, his, his inaugural and we're looking at the exact same broken and failed policies. Uh, the state of the news business isn't good and I think media consolidation has a lot to do with it. Uh, my last point would just be to reiterate some of the things that Wade is raising about diversity. Because I want to be clear that when the courts last threw out these FCC rules, they said to the FCC, deal with diversity first. You need to go and find out what the impact of further rule changes are going to be on the diversity of ownership before you change the rules, which, which seems pretty simple, and yet the FCC is refusing to do it. But what we do know is that very few people of color own television licenses. Very few women own television licenses. Seven percent for women, three percent for people of color. And we know that while the FCC has been studying this, the numbers are actually getting worse. Uh, TV stations owned by people of color have declined 20 percent since 2006. We've lost six minority-owned stations in just the last year, and now there are three, three African-American owners of television stations full power in the whole country. I just think it's the wrong direction, and I think these rules are a big deal because the stations that are going to be targets for acquisition, many of them are minority owned. Of the 43 stations owned by people of color in this country, 20 of them are outside the top four in the top 20 markets, excuse me, 19, 19 of them uh, outside the top four in the top 20 markets. These are the stations that uh, the big guys are going to come after when we relax these rules. So for the FCC to not even stop and study and look at these things and just to say, no, we have to do it now, you can wait till later, uh, diversity. Well, you know, I think people who care about diversity, uh, as in the vast majority of the American public, uh, are kind of tired of waiting and don't believe that media consolidation is going to have all these hypothetical benefits because they can see the very real world harms that we've seen. We've seen its damage to journalism. Tens of thousands of journalists lost their jobs. We've seen it's bad for business. Look at the state of the Tribune company, a company that got so big, took on so much debt that it's drowning in it. And now it took not only, that's happening not only in Chicago, but LA and Baltimore and Florida and uh, Hartford, Connecticut too, because of media consolidation. So I just find it impossible to believe that the thing we need to solve the crisis in journalism is more of the same bad medicine that got us so sick in the first place. Can I respond? Sure. <laughs> I'd like to get a chance to just point out a couple of things. One is that you, when you talk about uh, the, the things that have happened over the last few years, the media consolidation, first of all, you have to recognize 
that the rules that are on the books now haven't changed since 1999. Uh, all of the things that you just cited over the last uh, things, the, the, these rules have not changed since 1999. Uh, there was some uh, consolidation that happened in the, uh, because of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which did open up the market in the, uh, in the radio industry, but that was based on a lot of findings from the early 90s that showed that the industry was in serious trouble. When Congress made those choices and put those numbers into the, the act, it was looking at an industry that the commission had found was that half of the industry was, was uh, losing money. There were reasons why there was some opening up of that market. Let me turn to the other point, which is uh, with regard to uh, the minority ownership. I think that Steve made the same point that I think I would on this, which is that uh, you have to look at it. You can't simply say, okay, these numbers are bad, and if someone sells their station, then the number gets worse. Uh, you have to say, what is the real problem here? What, what are we dealing with? And so at, at NAB, for example, we have looked at the, uh, the minority ownership situation and said, it's abysmal. We, we agree. It's terrible. Uh, and what have we tried to do to address that? We have a, uh, a program that's called Broadcast Leadership Training. And in broadcast leadership training, we've had uh, some more than 200 people who have come through the program, learned the basics of how to get into the broadcasting uh, business, what do you have to do. And a good, uh, I, I don't have the number off my head, I should, uh, have turned into broadcast owners. One just recently sent a letter to the commission today uh, who was one of our graduates from our BLT program, is on our uh, uh, broadcast, is actually on our board. Uh, owned the Fox stations, owned a couple of Fox stations in Texas, uh, and said, look, the, the real problem here isn't the structural rules that we've got. The real problem is access to capital. And what we have to deal with is that access to capital. You can't deal with the fragmented market by simply saying, okay, we can all still be one station. You've got to deal with the access to capital issue. You've got to have the training through the programs like the BLT. You have to have incubator programs like uh, what we've been proposing on the record at the commission. You have to have a reinstatement of the tax certificate program, which NAB has been fighting for since 1996 when it was uh, taken down in the, in the Congress. Uh, and I know that the commission is in support of that as well. You have to have creative financing approaches, not just saying, okay, these structural rules somehow will solve the problem when they haven't. Uh, uh, Dan Gilmore, when he was writing at the San Jose Mercury News, had a wonderful phrase that he used every day, which is, uh, my readers know more than I do. So in this case, uh, uh, the audience uh, certainly knows more than I do, and we want to get to your questions and comments. Uh, we'll have, I believe, two microphones, two handheld microphones. So uh, if you raise your hand, we'll get to you. While the mics are in place, let me just throw something out. Uh, television viewers here in Washington, as a result of uh, cross-ownership rules, the major change they saw is that the CBS affiliate here um, uh, went from being owned by the Washington Post uh, to being owned by the Gannett Company. Mm -hmm. So not to pick on Gannett, certainly not in the museum, uh, <laughs> but, um, but... Or the Washington Post. But how were the interests of localism or diversity served by Channel 9 going from one newspaper company to another newspaper company? Any thoughts? Well, I, I don't... I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think I would reframe the question a little bit, which is that um, I don't think that the FCC has the power to block mergers just because they don't know whether or not it's going to help. They actually have to have evidence that it will hurt. So the fact that that happened and it was a wash is a, prob would probably be viewed as a neutral factor by the FCC. But I would also say that I, I actually don't, just as I don't believe that um, that every consolidation will lead to better journalism, um, I also don't believe that not doing it will lead to better journalism. In other words, you can see examples that have cut both ways. You can see examples where they got in, where they the, the cross-owned entity did have in, did have efficiencies, but they just pocketed the money and it led to you know greater dividends or executive bonuses. And you've seen other instances where the cross-owned entity did invest in local news. And this is one of the challenges, I think, for, for media policy. And that's why I would prefer an approach that tied it to a specific um, commitment to improving, uh, improving local uh, coverage or investment. And, and let me just add to that, Adam. I mean, I, the problem, let me be the, the cynic on the ground, 
uh, is that everything we've seen in the last five or six years suggests that any kind of synergies is the term that's often used, any combinations that take place are almost always done to create efficiencies and to create more profit. Uh, one of the biggest problems, especially for print, but I think it's true in broadcast as well, is you know people don't understand how immensely profitable these companies have been over a period of time. Uh, they've got hooked on that profit. They really uh, are trying to sustain that profitability at a time when that may not be the best thing to do to further the industry. Uh, and as a result, it's really hard to accept that uh, any kind of further consolidation could result in additional content coverage or increased employment. I, we talk about uh, you know ownership. We talk about diversity ownership, which is what the law requires. What I look at on a regular daily basis is diversity within employment. And I can tell you that since the, uh, the recession and uh, the huge downturn, that uh, on an anecdotal basis, uh, women uh, have left newsrooms in a, in, in a large way as well as people of color. And we've tried to be very careful as a union to not exacerbate that uh, through our layoff provisions. Uh, and so I assume that diversity of ownership was put in as a mechanism to try to create this further diversity of content coverage and employment. Uh, that's what I would like to see more of, and that's what I'm afraid will not come with the solution. Questions and comments from the audience? While they're lining up, can I jump in just real quick sure. and say that, you know, I mean, we're talking here about, oh, there was some consolidation in the 90s. Uh, there was massive consolidation in the 90s. That 96 Telecon Act uh, threw away the limits on radio ownership, and that has been a disaster for journalism. So if we're talking about wanting to, you know, hey, now we need newspapers to get into radio because, you know, maybe they'll have newsrooms because radio stations don't have newsrooms anymore because, you know, Clear Channel used to own 60 stations and now they own 1,000 stations. That's what we've watched happen again and again and again is when we, we open the door to consolidation, it's been bad for journalism. So if our goal is to save journalism, the first thing we should stop doing is opening the door to more consolidation. Uh, two points. One is, as I recall, the advent of the cross-ownership rules in the late 60s or early 70s, in fact, imperiled a number of major print operations because they lost the revenue from their broadcast outlets. The second is my question that in the age of digital television with multiple channels on one frequency and the internet and cable, is there a constitutional basis to support the FCC's meddling in ownership, where in other industries the government can't do the same thing? Band scarcity no longer justifies that. I, th I think that's an interesting point that raises another uh, interesting issue, which is that uh, one of the, the great benefits that we've gotten from the digital transition are these multicast channels. And it's a, been an entree for, uh, for a good deal of minority-oriented programming and, my, and uh, women and minority networks that have sprung up that are on these multicast channels at this point. But recently, we've seen a huge increase in the numbers of, uh, of the uh, channels that are on those D2 and D3 channels. Uh, the uh, Bounce TV network is one of the uh, one of the examples. is a uh, African American owned network, new network that's on the the, the channels reaching 80 percent of the African American audience now. Uh, as a result of uh, of the, the digital transition, I think that's been a very positive uh, factor, and uh, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, focusing on that that aspect of the industry as well. There's probably no uh, chance of the FCC deciding not to regulate. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone says don't regulate at I all, but I think or, that or that's the a... Courts. I mean, these are still incredibly valuable yeah. properties with a huge reach. They're the number one source of news, broadcast television, still number one source of news. Uh, they made billions of dollars from this election for a reason. 80% of all... Election spending, spending. Yeah. broadcast television. Remember that when they go to the FCC pleading poverty, but fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so, so the idea that there, this still doesn't matter, and where it really matters, local news. The dominant local news sources are these daily newspapers and these daily television stations. So the Internet's a wonderful thing. It's done a lot of great things. It's complicated some things for the news business. But when it comes to where people get those local news, the FCC's own studies show those are the dominant outlets. And these rules still matter there, too, because we, we start losing owners. We start combining newsrooms. Then we've got even fewer sources of local news. 
uh, be because of these, of these very rules. And that's what we don't want to see happen. We don't want to see the few remaining sources, the few people who still go out and go to the school board meetings and cover local government uh, being shrunk and disappearing even further. Okay, I think you have to remember the size of markets also makes a difference. Uh, and you just cited the, uh, some of the numbers with regard to the political campaigns. I can tell you based on what my uh, membership told me, that depended a lot on where you were. If you were in a battleground Ohio state, <laughs> Ohio did yes. very well. Uh, you know, <laughs> amazingly, North Carolina and Virginia had, uh, did pretty good themselves. But that, that isn't true across the board. And if you get down into, Steve said, there's 210 television markets across this country. Uh, and not every one of those markets is one where people are making money hand over fist, and I would even contend on many levels that they're not. But in the smaller markets, which is particularly where I think you need to have some of the kind of relief that we're talking about here, I think you could have the biggest impact. The advertising uh, base that on which the, the television stations depend has been fragmented. It's not just the internet. It's also the cable, uh, the, the multi-channel providers. Uh, that have been taking a larger and larger portion of the uh, advertising base and in order to continue to provide the public interest programming that the stations want to do. And they want to do the journal local journalism. They've got to have that, they, they have to have the kind of size and scale to be able to, uh, to fund it. So it, it, would there be a, a, does it have to be ownership though? I'm thinking of a number of situations where pe people sell a station and, or stations in combination. Uh, and uh, that's one of the, the, the issues. We, uh, stations, in fact, have uh, joined, gone, gone into joint sales arrangements or sometimes a shared services arrangement. And that actually is one of the issues that uh, we've got some concerns about uh, the reports on what's in the, law, the commission's order, uh, that they want to create a joint sales arrangement as an attributable ownership interest. Uh, which would mean that then you couldn't continue those kinds of efficient joint sales arrangements. And we think that that has that would be something that would be very bad. In fact, on the record in the proceeding, we have a number of, uh, of our groups that have gone in and have uh, effectively explained that this is how they, in fact, are funding their local news and how they're managing to, to stay above water, and they think that that's very important. Steve, you look troubled. Yeah, well, no, I just wanted to throw out a kind of a specific example that shows how a kind of theological approach to this of consolidation good, consolidation bad, doesn't necessarily reflect the nuance of the, the modern media market. If you take something like New Orleans, New Orleans, the Times-Picayune, by the way, a merger between the Times and the Picayune, um, wa, uh, just uh, went to three days a week uh, printing and cut 200 uh, newsroom staff. Half of the minority reporters were laid off. Okay, so point A is that one of the main factors determining uh, minority employment in journalism is not actually minority ownership. It's the health of newspapers in certain communities. They're both important, but that second thing is, is okay. also important. When the community got together to, uh, alarmed at what was happening, the Archbishop of New Orleans was part of the, uh, the coalition to try to save the Times-Picayune. His reason, he said, cutting back on the Times-Picayune will hurt the poor, and we need to help make sure that their voices are heard. So again, this wasn't um, a matter of, of an ownership issue in terms of diverse ownership, but it was a matter of is there an institution in the, in the city that is, taking, uh, that is covering these issues. Finally, um, this is a bit hypothetical, but the, when the uh, Newhouse announced that they were doing this, the owner of the New Orleans Saints said, I'll buy the newspaper and I'll, I'll keep it printed five days a week or seven days a week. Now, Newhouse didn't want to sell it, so it became a moot point. But even if Newhouse had said yes, they wouldn't have been allowed to because the owner of the Saints owns a Fox affiliate in mm -hmm. New Orleans. So that's the case where being allowed to potentially own the, the newspaper there, someone who had owned a, a, a station in the air, may have actually helped to have more minority employment, more coverage of, uh, of important issues in the community. <laughs> I see some hands in the audience. Uh, yes, Hi. could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Cheryl Lianza. I work for the United Church of Christ Media Justice Ministry, and we've been fighting for civil rights and media for more than 50 years. And I wanted to bring it back um, because we work so hard alongside our civil rights allies. Wanted to bring it back to what 
um, Wade started off this discussion with, which is the, the failure of the FCC to conduct analysis and collect adequate data about women and people of color's participation and ownership of the media. Um, the FCC, what I think Craig made this point, but I want to make sure that we get a response to it, because the courts told the FCC you have been, you articulate a concern about diversity of ownership, and then you ignore it, you don't collect the data, and then you throw up your hands and say, oh, we don't have the data, we can't do anything about it, so we're just going to go ahead and make these tweaks over here to the other ownership rules, but we continue to ignore the need for the data to support minority ownership and women ownership. And the industry keeps talking about the tax certificate, but the tax certificate has not moved in Congress. And in fact, if the, F if the Congress was going to adopt a new tax certificate policy to readopt the old policy that they had, we would still need these studies that the FCC continues to ignore, because if you don't have data to support a race conscious policy, it's not going to withstand constitutional review. So we need these studies. And I and so the civil rights community is still waiting. And the only thing that we have been able to hang on to is that the court told the FCC you can't consolidate media until you get these studies done. And um, you know, Adiran, the, the Supreme Court Adiran case was in 1995. It's been a long time. We still don't have the studies. And at best, this time we still have is another future promise of a tentative maybe we'll get the studies done in another couple of years. But nobody's ever been able to hold the FCC to that. And I'm sort of looking for support from folks who want consolidation to, well, where's the studies? Where is that, where is that work that needs to be done? Well, you know, I, and I see three universities represented in the audience, uh, <laughs> any one of which will be delighted to. Uh, <laughs> Trying to get you there. Can, can I just respond to Cheryl's point, which is that, uh, in, in fact, we agree that this is exactly something that needs to be done. Uh, I, I can't say it first. often enough. It, it's one of the points. No, I don't agree with the first point, because I think that uh, you have to look at what is the issue. Uh, and you have to say, are there mean, how are we going to do this? And is it that by keeping rules that have been on the books for a long time and haven't done anything to help, means that, that we have to assume that they're, they're going to do something that they haven't done for 10 years or 14 years uh, and before we can move forward? No, we should be focusing on what are ways to actually move forward. And the NAB in our comments and those in our industry have endorsed any number of different kinds of ideas. Let's do the studies and, and, and get some information. In the meantime, let's start an incubator program uh, that is based on a race neutral approach that we may be able to, to move forward with right now that may be that something which can have a current owner of a station that helps to, to bring in minority female uh, participants into the industry why not have some sort of a revision of the way that you can have the uh, owner financing so that you can have someone who has an interest that can then, again, bring along uh, a, a new owners into the industry. There's some huge number of ideas, uh, and we have been talking with others in the, in the community, with, the, with some of the folks from the MMPC uh, and, and many of the other groups, and saying, okay, let's focus on what we can do to move this forward uh, in a positive way, and let's be responsive to what the what the Third Circuit had to say. We're not opposed to that. So, so I don't mean to question the NAB's motives here, because I think that they probably do want uh, greater diversity. I've heard Gordon Smith say it on a, a number of a number of times. But the question that I keep coming back to is then, how come these consolidation policies are always the first priority? So the court's been very clear. The court has said you need to look at this first. The NAB is saying we agree you should look at it. Okay, well, let's do it. We don't, we don't need to r rush through changes without doing it. Let's go ahead and look at it. Minority tax certificate, that's something the NAB and free press can agree on. Let's After work on that. Time. Let's put our energies toward <laughs> those changes. I think that sounds great. Let's put Steve's <laughs> ideas on the table. Yeah, I will shake on the minority I tax will. certificate. I Absolutely. will. Absolutely. Go, <laughs> let's go in together and work on that. Let's get it passed. That sounds like a fantastic Ooh. idea. Capitol Hill is six blocks from here. <laughs> 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 we'll, we're open for business. Right after this. <laughs> uh, I, I think that would, that would be a great thing for us to work on. Let's put Steve's ideas out for discussion. Let's have the public debate. But the FCC is not doing that right now. What they're doing is saying, well, we got to move on this right now, and uh, let's lift these rules and lift that, those rules, and maybe we'll come back and have these conversations later. And I, I think that's the real fundamental flaw here, is that they're not weighing these new ideas. They're not looking toward the future. What they're doing is saying, hey, let's just do more of what we've already been doing, because that supposedly worked out so well, when all the evidence that I can see says it didn't work out that well. In fact, it was disastrous for so many local communities. Maybe New Orleans is an exception. If that's a truly failing paper, then, then we can talk about waivers on these case-specific things. The FCC already has that on the books. But I think, by and large, uh, we haven't done that, and we haven't created the incentives. Let's create incentives for local ownership. 
so that these big companies, as they're drowning in debt, let's give them reasons to sell to local owners, people who are actually going to be in the community. I think there could be a lot of great work done on those issues, but the first thing we have to do is do no harm, and we can't go back later and say, oh, it would have been great if we had done that stuff, but sorry, it's all been snapped up. Well, well I think a couple responses that have to be made to that. One, I, I think it's unfair to the, uh, chastise the FCC so much on this. I think that we've had uh, the various diversity committees have tried to move this forward. Uh, yes, we can do better, uh, and I think that that's important. The FCC also has an obligation. It's a statutory obligation to look at these rules and, and evaluate them in light of competition in the industry. Uh, and they, as I said before, the rules haven't changed in, since 1999. As despite the statutory requirement, I think you do have to look at the rules. And if you can look at them and say, this is not what is the, the issue with regard to minority ownership, then maybe we should be looking at the competition side of it and look at what's happened in the industry and actually address those. And I think that those things can move forward. Uh, you, you keep saying that we've, it's the same thing we've done before. We actually have not. Uh, I don't think we've actually really looked at what are the real causes of the problems in journalism? So the, the things that you've cited, the, the changes have happened in light of rules that the newspaper cross ownership rules have been in there since uh, 1975. That's that's been since that long. It hasn't helped the newspaper <laughs> industry or the broadcast industry. Point of information: well, uh, Are there are there are there any hearings scheduled in this? Uh, no, I, the last hearing I saw in this uh, that commissioners attended was 2007, I think. When, you're, when Steve did the uh, Future of TV like, report, right, there was, was a lot of analysis yeah. of this issue, a great deal of it. Uh, there were some other on media ownership, yeah. I think. There, there were hearings all over the country yeah. that were, I can't remember, I, I was at them all. But <laughs> In 2007, <laughs> without the current. I did, I did attend them all. <laughs> uh, saw a hand up in the audience? Well, I, ha I have the microphone, oh, somebody has so okay. Okay. I'm going to ask a question. Hey, Andy. This is Andy Schwartzman. <laughs> Uh, this is for Steve Waldman. First, a, a point of information. Uh, actually, uh, uh, a broadcaster or an applicant to a purchase a broadcasting station has an obligation to demonstrate that the transaction is in the public interest, an affirmative obligation. It's not only if the FCC finds harm. It's the other way around. You have to demonstrate it's in the public interest. My question, jumping off of that, which Craig has foreshadowed a little bit, is right now, there, in the, under existing rules, waivers are permitted. Indeed, Rupert Murdoch got a waiver uh, to save the New York Post from, uh, uh, from what uh, he alleged was, was an imminent death. Uh, that would work in your hypothetical New Orleans situation. In light of that, why do you see any need for change in the rules, which is what you've advocated? Well, this is an area where I don't know if I would do it exactly the same way that the FCC is doing it. I would probably have a, criteria, a waiver criteria be the heart of the policy. Um, having said that, the, there was a real lost opportunity in, the, in this process, which was the, in the proposed rule, the FCC said, hey, there's this idea out here called the four-factor test, which said, if you invest in local communities, that could be an important factor in favor of the waiver. Now, there were lots of problems with this particular four-factor test. I was very disappointed that, that uh, in their comments, Free Press not only opposed the four-factor test, but didn't propose an alternative, as I understand it. And in fact, neither did the broadcasters. In fact, when I talked to the FCC about this and said, hey, you know, I think there may be problems with the four-factor test, but at least it had the idea of uh, maybe we could tie policy to some demonstrable proof of, okay? they said, well, everyone opposed that. Uh, it seemed to be the one thing that everyone agreed on was that the four-factor test, which I think means it was a bad idea, which, which <laughs> I think is a lost opportunity because I think uh, if, if, if Free Press and, and NAB had put their heads together to come up with an idea for, okay, maybe the wording in that particular thing wasn't right, but if we were able to come up with language that tied media ownership decisions to whether or not there's investment in the community, that would have been a step forward. And instead, we ended up with a sort of Washington game, forgive me, um, 
where in order to establish, the, I, I would assume, the kind of bargaining position, free press was against everything and NAB was in favor of everything. I'm overstating it, but. Um, <laughs> and what we didn't end up with was a creative policy solution. Well, I, you know, what, you, you, you talked about policy going back to the 70s, and I think it's important to look at uh, what happened in the 70s with newspapers, the effort to create joint operating agreements. Uh, it was an effort uh, to allow consolidation, but to maintain newsrooms. So it was an innovation, like Steve talked about, one where there was some incentive uh, to keep something alive within a community. Now we know in practice that the JOAs kept some papers alive for a while, in some cases for a long while. They didn't necessarily work in the long run, not, not in the current environment. Uh, but those kind of policies do matter. I, one thing I don't want to be lost in any of this fight over policy and certainly over profitability is that journalism itself is in trouble. Uh, you may think that there's plenty of, plenty of journalism on that web thing, but the truth is there really isn't. And the studies that have been done have shown that uh, the amount of original sourcing journalism is extremely low in the United States compared to what it has been. And the numbers show that. Um, so. The question is, do we solve uh, the problems for the owners who want more profitability? Remember profitability that may go into the 20, 30 percent range, which yeah, is what it. it used to be. Uh, they don't want to have eight or nine percent. In the case of Newhouse in New Orleans, I don't know what the Times Picayune was doing. I, I, Newhouse didn't want to sell because I suggest they're making money. Now we're trying to keep Newhouse from taking the Cleveland Plain Dealer down the same path. There are, <laughs> the community is in strong support of our uh, campaign to save the Plain Dealer, but again, they're going to do what they're going to do in the name of profitability, and there's no incentive for them to be concerned about journalism. Just, so, just to be clear, what's your plan for Cleveland? Well, we're trying to keep seven-day uh, mm -hmm. printing of some kind. Uh, you know, the general feeling is it's cool to say print is dead. Uh, I don't believe print is dead. I believe that it, it, it print is challenged. Uh, you know, when TV came out, they didn't shut down the movie studios. Uh, although some of the current publishers uh, might have done that if they owned the uh, movie studios at the time. Um, so the, the, in, in Cleveland, what we want to do is at least keep uh, some kind of printing present on a daily basis uh, to supplement whatever happens on a digital basis. Remember that there's a huge digital divide in the country. Uh, if you're in, in an area that has Fios and you can afford uh, broadband, you'll be able to get the website. Uh, a lot of poor communities don't have that kind of access and they can't afford internet. Um, so when the, when the publication goes out of business, the joke in Detroit when they made the change uh, to three or four day delivery was don't die on a Monday because uh, you're not going to get your obit in the paper until the following weekend. Uh, and Gannett made that change in Detroit uh, along with uh, Media News and there's every indication that Detroit has been profitable in the print operation, not as profitable as they'd like to be, uh, but therein still lies the challenge. So how do we, how do yeah. we bring this together? Policy, journalism, uh, and profitability. And you know this, uh, since, I, since I've been sort of defending potential relaxation of ownership rule in this case, I want to come back and actually say this is the reason why I mostly think the consolidation rules should not be relaxed. And the bigger issue that you see, and it's really not something that the FCC can even get at with ownership rules, is that you do see time and time again that newspapers, even though the internet is what caused this, ownership structure of media companies did exacerbate the problem and did make it harder for them to respond. There are newspapers out there that are break even, which from a community point of view is fine. They may not be making 30% margin anymore or 40% margin anymore, but they're important institutions. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a publicly traded company, that doesn't really cut it, which is why in the FCC report and other people uh, have made the same point, we need to have innovation from other sources, including from the nonprofit sector. And that was partly where my idea you know, points to, but there's a lot of other things pointing toward that, that we're not going to be able to create organically uh, growing media without new players uh, and without the nonprofit sector, frankly, playing a greater role. And, and you really can't continue to say that, uh, to focus only on one aspect of the industry and pretend that the rest don't exist. The rules that we keep talking about here are applicable to broadcast radio and television. There's a lot of other outlets out there that are not subject to these kinds of restrictions and are out there searching for the same advertising dollars, the same support, the same profitability. And profitability really isn't a bad thing in this country. Uh, is that you have to have 
uh, you have to recognize the true environment that we're in. And if you have to be on multiple platforms, and it's interesting, you, when you kicked off the stuff, you, you talked about, well, you, you know, want to be on a website and you want to have uh, different kinds of platforms, you have to recognize that that's the reality where we are and we should be evaluating these rules in light of that reality. Thank you. I see someone else with a microphone in the white sweater. Hello, uh, I'm Robert Charetta, President of International Investor. And, and I'd like to just make two quick points and, and get anyone's reaction to them. The first is, uh, as we look out in the future, we see uh, an increasingly complex world of ownership of media. Private equity players, institutional investors of all sorts, many international, working their way into the media of every nation, all driven by economies of scale, low-cost production is uh, their ultimate goal, but when necessary, they'll supply whatever amount of money is necessary to capture large global audiences if need be. And they'll do this largely in the entertainment space. Once again, we'll be giving up the opportunities to create worthwhile news, worthwhile international news, worthwhile local news. So. The only way I, I can even imagine dealing with this at the national level or the local level is by going back to an era where we insisted that a certain portion of broadcasting, a certain portion of our newspaper coverage be devoted to those local issues. I, I don't pretend to think that there was, uh, maybe there was a golden age, but I don't think there was any ideal that went on forever. So here's my question. We it's the public that grants broadcasting licenses. They have to be renewed. Should we move toward a platform where we insist on a certain number of hours, even in prime time, not only be devoted to local news, but be devoted to alternative voices, diverse voices? Same with newspaper coverage. Should we insist on a certain number of pages within the local newspapers be devoted to not only local news, but diverse viewpoints as well? Everyone does this to a certain degree because they find it's in their interest to say they're doing so. But I'm talking about something where you take a sizable portion of prime time, a sizable portion of the real pages of a newspaper, and we as a public insist that they cover the issues we think are important. I think we may need to separate a couple of things because the FCC can regulate broadcasting but not newspapers. Right, and there's never been any <coughs> requirement of specific thing, specific uh, content in newspapers uh, of any kind. Uh, largely, the First Amendment would uh, really be turned on its head if you were to try to go there. Um, but uh, in terms of should we be doing that, you know, interestingly, I think that the, uh, this is happening. I referred a few minutes ago to the, uh, the D2 channels, the, the, the diverse channels on the broadcasting television. And what you're finding in there is that you are getting uh, some, a lot of diverse programming in there. It's, it's langu foreign language programming that's, that, that's coming in in certain markets. Uh, a lot of uh, the uh, Hispanic programming aimed at the Hispanic audiences, the, the African American programming that's coming in, that's being devoted on those channels. Now, you're, you're talk, you keep talking about a, a specific area of, uh, of local news, and I think that is something that uh, is dependent on the market. And what we've seen over the last few years is that there's actually been an increase uh, in the local news markets where the, where the stations can get the kind of uh, scale and scope to be able to do that. And that's, I think, the better way to do it than trying to dictate that there be some specific amount because I, I, you're just not going to be able to afford that. The FCC has also occasionally, uh, um, let's say, loudly suggested, going back some years, when I was at CBS, we were certainly responding to uh, things that the FCC uh, uh, suggested might be a good idea. Uh, but uh, there hasn't been as much suggesting lately. <laughs> well, and I think, I, I actually agree with the idea that broadcast is different despite the changes in the marketplace because the, the license is to the public airwaves. The, the problem, and so I do think there should be an obligation that broadcasters have to give the community something for that. But the problem with having it be, you know, a number of hours is, first of all, as Jane said, uh, local news is increasing its number of hours. And the problem is that they're doing that by repeating the same news that they did at 5 o'clock. So you could do, if you did an hours count, I don't think you would achieve very much. And in fact, 
I don't know if you um, requiring that station number 8, 9, and 10 in the community also have a local newscast and probably what would be a pretty lousy local newscast uh, would necessarily you know, help society. So I think that you want to look for something. One of the things I thought was a really easy thing that the broadcasters could do to help uh, show their good faith was to put the political files that they had in their filing cabinets online uh, as the FCC proposed. I was disappointed that uh, the broadcasters actually fought that, which would seem to me to be a kind of bare minimum uh, expression of, of serving the public interest in the community. I, you know, I'd like to say <laughs> that, uh, so the ideas you brought up would, you know, would take a pretty radical change in our culture to ever get to that point. But having said that, there are some things we could do with policy uh, that could really change the landscape in a very constructive way. And one of those is universal access to internet. And remember that this was a problem with the telephone uh, as well back in the day. And electricity. And, it, and electricity. Mm -hmm. And so there, were, uh, there was a lot of money spent uh, as a country to make sure that there was, in fact, universal access. If the same thing was happening right now uh, with broadband, uh, whether it be a, a wireless technology or a, a wired technology, and you took down those barriers, uh, we might not even be here talking about traditional media because it may not matter. The new technologies would just come in and maybe usurp. Uh, you could then broadcast over the internet knowing that you could actually have an audience. We do know, I know from my own children, that they would much more rather have a la carte choices of media than buy into some big cable package. Uh, I think that there is some hope in the new technology, but that again is gonna be a question for policy and whether we wanna make some changes. I see a hand in the front row, and there's probably somebody who has a microphone. Can you hear me? All right, uh, my name is Joe Torres Free Press. I have a couple of points. Uh, first of all, um, newspapers, as, as Andy was, uh, I think was saying, are still remain profitable. If they uh, want to own the TV station, ask for a waiver request, right? And layoffs, Steve, they've been happening for a long time. It's accelerated in recent years. Remember what Jay Harris famously resigned in 2001 because the San Jose Mercury News wanted him to uh, push the profit margin beyond 30%, and he refused. Uh, state houses have been cut for a long time. Uh, uh, state bureaus have been, is, is not a new trend. Uh, companies have been, relax, uh, been laying off workers for a long time to order to maximize profit. So that's one thing, that's nothing new. 25 of the 26 stations, minority owned stations that are no longer minority owned since 2006, uh, they're no longer minority owned because they had to sell because of financial distress and none of them got back into the market. So this is a crisis, a real crisis, and to, and to say that news, the, the, uh, the newspapers can own TV, uh, uh, TV stations and yet the FCC, all they has to do is actually, why don't you study to see what the impact is? Before you change a rule, study it. That's all we're asking. Study the rules, prove it. Prove there's gonna be no harm to minority ownership. If you can't prove it, then you, the court say you shouldn't do it. That's another thing. Um, <coughs> uh, newspaper diversity. That's the other thing, is like 1978, ASNI had a goal of have reaching diversity by 2000, newsroom diversity. It came nowhere, near, nowhere close. They pushed it to 2025. Where are these newspapers when it comes to uh, newsroom diversity? So the idea that people of color have to wait for companies that are profitable to get the last remaining minority-owned stations potentially to increase their profit, while people of color can't speak for ourselves and own our own outlets, when with 37 percent, close to 40 percent of the population, I think is a mer very moral question. We ask, what kind of country are we when, we're, when people of color can't even speak for themselves, when other people have to tell our stories, and then the content that we do see about us is marginalized. It marginalizes our community. But yet, these are the owners, like the Rupert Murdochs, that we have to turn us, the last remaining stations, we'll give it to Rupert Murdoch so he can further demonize our community. It just doesn't make sense. It's a, not a, it's, it is a question of, it's a, not only this is a policy question, I, I truly believe it's a moral question as well. So I'm, I'm exacerbating my friend here from the other side of the industry that knows it's exacerbated too. So I told him I was going to give him the mic too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I see um, two no, people the in, in, in the front who uh, want to reply. Uh, Dwight? <laughs> Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Uh, Dwight Ellis, um, former NAB exec and current uh, six year college professor. Bowie State University. Uh, I, I, I find a, a lot of deja vu here, uh, having been there before with most of you. Uh, one thing that I, I see, having served on both sides with the NAB 
and now with the uh, collegiate community and, and been in private industry after NAB, it looks like we what we need is, and someone mentioned it up there, we need to get back to the development of new ideas. Uh, this is a new place. Uh, the, 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 whole, the whole game plan is very different. Yes, it is about economics. Yes, it is about money. But it's also about the marketplace of ideas. And, and I have a question in relationship to that. Many years ago, from the 70s forward, the NAB, as the industry representative, took a leading role. We were a major, at that time, a major marketplace of ideas since we consistently hold the largest and probably most well-known convention in the world on the subject. Now, my question is, is the NAB still providing that level of leadership, which is even greater than NCTA? And if that is so, then since I will be attending the NAB convention this year, along with BEA, I'm going to be very anxious to see if the NAB is going to have a session, minor or major, on this topic there. Because, and I, I close with this, not only do the new leaders of the, of the whole digitized community of, of media, whether it's uh, uh, broadcasting or, or newspaper, whatever the other legacy, in the, they, they, all of the players are new now. And many of them, in an age of convergence, will be at the NAB, along with the lawyers of MMTC and the others who provide that. Now is the time for the NAB, because we have the history. We am not with the NAB anymore. But the NAB has the history <laughs> and the relationships, more, much more so than cable. And now we can step up the NAB legislatively and otherwise to begin to make a difference once more. That's what I want to say. We well, don't have Michael Powell here to um, respond for the cable <laughs> industry, but uh, let, we let, do let have me, let, me, let me just say quickly back to you, Dwight, that uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is, I, I, try, I started down the road a little bit before. NEB has been trying to take a leadership role in increasing uh, the minority and female ownership in our industry for some time. We do it through the programs through our NAB Education Foundation, the broadcast leadership training that I mentioned before, the executive development training program that we've done. At the NAB, we have a major session for, uh, for uh, getting together with people for uh, job opportunities. That's the BEA job. program is, is definitely uh, a, a huge part of, of all of this. Uh, we have uh, we've consistently supported trying to get back the tax certificate, and I'm, I'm talking to Craig after here to see how we uh, set up the, uh, the, the, the program to, to, keep this, uh, to keep it moving. Uh, we uh, have un endorsed uh, any number of uh, ideas that are on the record at the FCC for uh, some uh, other types of regulatory reform that address the real issue that we see, which is the, uh, the access to capital issue. And so, yeah, I think oh, we're there. We <laughs> and and the sessions on ownership, on, on uh, access to capital, both on the radio show side and on the TV side, are always there. Let's go from NAB to NAA. I see yeah. uh, a couple go of people Paul. here from the Newspaper <laughs> Association. Hi, Paul Boyle with the Newspaper Association of America, and this has been a great program. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk about radio. So uh, we've seen a lot of changes in the radio environment over the years, and there's been a decline in local news on radio. And as national companies could come in in a local market and buy a radio station, uh, that local news provider in that market, the newspaper, has had to sit on the sidelines since 1975. And we are in the best position to produce local news. That's kind of in our DNA. That's what we do. So from our perspective, it makes sense if there's a radio station not producing local news that the newspaper could uh, potentially be a buyer. and produce local news, public affairs programming, uh, interview community leaders, and get different viewpoints out there in the community. But my question is, uh, uh, is, is regarding this waiver standard, it's been raised several times. So if you're a seller of a house and you have two buyers and both come in at the same price, but one has a contingency, who are you going to go with? You're probably going to go with the buyer that doesn't have the contingency. And this waiver process uh, takes a long time. I, I'm not that familiar with it. I was going to ask Jane, 
as far as the realities of going and seeking a, a waiver at the FCC? Uh, is that an impediment to folks to actually investing? Uh, and how long does it take? I mean, from our perspective, it's it, it's kind of a non-starter. But it, it it absolutely is an impediment to people if you have a rule that works. And I don't know if he's still here. I think I saw David Oxenford up in the audience somewhere, who represents the media brokers, uh, and they they're on record at the at the commission uh, to say that they're having the bad structural rules are the kinds of things that cause problems with the with the brokerage deals. And I think that's exactly what you have to to look at. But, but structure aside, do uh, you think that newspapers should just be openly free to buy radio stations? Well, I mean, I guess that uh, it's the kind of, we haven't seen a lot of combinations like that. There have been some in the past, clearly. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm talking 20s, 30s, uh, <laughs> earlier on. Um, again, uh, it, it may be part of the solution. But I think there has to be somewhere in this, if you're going to allow the combinations in the first place, it's, I think it's right to build in some criteria for expectations. And, uh, you know, I think that's what we'd like to see. So it's not about what are you against. It's what are you looking to solve, what are you for, and how do we get there? I think there's a lot of agreement here on the stage in terms of ideas uh, and things that would be constructive. Uh, now, how we get there is, is another question entirely. I mean, I, I do want to leave this in a constructive place. We do have a commitment to, uh, to a democracy here that depends on journalism. And if that means trying some things that we wouldn't consider otherwise, then you know maybe we need to go ahead and try some solutions. On the other hand, uh, you know the, the fear right now, and it's just a really basic fear. And I know people say, well, you know, you can't, you shouldn't just be against uh, combinations and amalgamation. But th there's little evidence right now that shows that uh, there's more. There's no real commitment. You talk about diversity. When the money got tough in in the newspaper industry and in a, a lot of industries, diversity went out the window. I mean, that was just a sad fact. And, you know, I, I get it. I don't like it. Um, it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, if you look at the most recent election, if you learn anything from it, the country has changed, and people better wake up to that. But we're so far behind right now. Uh, you know, we have got to have some solutions. So uh, we've had a good kind of fist fight over policy here <laughs> on the stage, but uh, I still would like to see some better dialogue about things that are going to actually create new content, uh, bring in new voices, uh, and really create some kind of way of uh, getting new messages out that, that, that currently we're not even discussing. Craig, how to go forward? So, uh, no, I mean, I, I certainly agree with a lot of what Bernie said, and, and I'd be happy to entertain a lot more of these discussions if I didn't feel like the FCC was rushing to just uh, do everything on one side and push for more consolidation. And I, it's in, from my perspective, uh, that needs to be stopped. It's not in the public interest. They haven't made the case, uh, and uh, the courts and Congress and everyone else have been very clear uh, that they haven't done that. If we want to step back and have a, have a larger discussion and work on things that are more of a, a, a trade-off, actually talk about how we're going to invest in local journalism, well, I think that's a different, a different discussion, but you've got to actually make the case. We have to get past this sort of hypothetical, well, if you just allow us to merge some more, then that's going to magically improve newsrooms, create more jobs, because the evidence has been on the other side with all of this consolidation. So. Now, so, so setting aside those objections, sure, let's talk about the big ideas. Let's talk about what kind of public investment we actually need. Let's talk about redirecting some of these things. You know, the NAB says they spend billions of dollars every year to meet their public interest obligations. Maybe we should redirect some of that money toward journalism and make nonprofits and for profit uh, eligible for that funding. We can get really creative here. Um, but what we've got to stop doing is the, the damage that we know that we know media consolidation has caused. We've got to set that aside, and then there's actually room for this conversation. Those billions of dollars are spent on public interest programming. So whether it's uh, the uh, messages that go out to your local community, whether it's your local news, all of that is how we serve the basic public interest obligation that broadcasters do have and take very seriously and, and try to address every day. I see two hands right over here. Um, okay, Larry, I guess, is next. Yeah. Who has the mic? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I've got the mic. I, I'm Mark Gruenberg from Washington Baltimore Newspaper Guild, which is part of the Newspaper Guild. And I'd like to turn the discussion back to um, the, li the link between uh, um, hugeness, for lack of a better term, and, me and media ownership and lack of diversity by using a, an example, and that's the Tribune Company which I'm familiar with both as a Chicagoan and as a member of the Newspaper Guild. Its top four papers 
the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, Baltimore Sun, LA Times, Hartford Current covered and cover heavily minority communities. They were also owned by one huge conglomerate and Tribune Company, and this is typical of these huge conglomerates, owns everything from cable to broadband to the biggest job search engine in the country to do it to to uh, the biggest ca to uh, regular over the air broadcasting to you name it. It covers those four communities, but it, to say that the Tribune Company is not diverse is putting it mildly. Uh, the newsroom percentage in Baltimore, not only did the overall um, nose count go down, but the minority nose, nose count went down. Same thing in Chicago, same thing in LA, same thing in Hartford. So that's the linkage. How do you flip that linkage so that you get both minority, more minority ownership and more minority participation hand in hand? Any response? Um, you know, one, one thing is that the um, tax laws and bankruptcy laws need to be looked at in a way that would make it easier for newspapers to disaggregate, to peel off from large uh, media companies. Uh, I think that's an area where you could potentially have companies being more rooted in, in their communities. I wanted to also mention, you know, the rationale for why the FCC is looking at being looser in the top 20 markets than in the others. So again, they're basically, as I understand it, agreeing with Craig on markets 21 to 210. They're disagreeing on markets 1 through 20. Um, the rationale for that is that there are more players in the larger markets. So that if you go from, if, to take a hypothetical, if you go from nine stations to eight stations, but it were to help uh, the, a com combined entity of a newspaper and a TV station to do more uh, local news, that would be a good trade-off. Uh, I would take that deal. Now, as I said, there's a question of how can you be sure that that would happen. The study that the SEC actually had said that, uh, based on the academic studies, combined entities of newspaper and broadcast did produce more news uh, than they were before. Now, I don't want to put huge market. amounts of stake in this particular study, because my view is that this, it probably cuts both ways. But, uh, but there is some evidence that in limited cases, and the reason that you would if you wanted to experiment, that the place to experiment with it would be in the top 20 markets, is that you can have mergers like this with less of a potential negative impact on the diversity of voices simply because there are more voices to start with in communities like that. I would think that that is the rationale for why they're looking at relaxing it just in those top markets. I, I also think that, by the way, we probably would have been, uh, this has been a great, great panel, but. Um, having someone actually from the FCC to defend the FCC's position. He's in Davos. <laughs> I canceled my trip to Davos. He's, he, there are all sorts of very talented people at the FCC uh, besides the chairman. Uh, can I ask a question about that? Is there some magic to top 20, not 25 or 15? Was there some break point there that you know? You know, there's a kind of history and economic analysis that has pointed to that breakdown, not just now, but I think in the past, but someone else better It, actually, it that. actually depends on the rules. I've seen it top 50, I've seen it top 20, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what was the rationale be for, the, for the 20 versus 25, 50, whatever. Yeah. It's, um, I'm just not sure. Larry. Uh, Larry Kirkman, American University. Uh, where does public media fit into this discussion of uh, uh, solutions uh, for local news. Uh, NPR has proclaimed that diversity is its number one priority, race, ethnicity, age, and geography. Uh, there Are there opportunities to link uh, public radio stations, in particular, to newspapers at the local level? I, I think the answer to that is absolutely. And, uh, and that's the whole question of what, how we can mix nonprofits and profits 
uh, we even for a time, and we're still pursuing it, the idea of a, uh, a new limited liability corporation called an L3C that allows for nonprofit investment into pro for profit companies. Uh, obviously, right now, talking tax stuff with the Congress is not a real popular kind of thing to do, but uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is there's some things that could be done to encourage this, and we've seen some experiments around the country where uh, public radio and television are cooperating, including through and with universities, uh, in creating cooperatives. The Bay Citizen is like that in San Francisco, uh, and there are other projects. And I would say that uh, uh, public radio and television are very much, especially because of their model and their connection already to the community. All of this comes back to connections to the community. The problem in uh, journalism really only happened when, especially newspapers, became very corporatized. So anything we can do, like these models, to get connections back to the community, and, and yes, public radio and television are perfectly poised to, to step in right now and, and be part of the solution. And there is actually a public policy angle to this, which is without in any way saying anything about the Comcast merger's overall merit or demerit, there was a very interesting and little known condition in the Comcast merger, which was that uh, Part of the conditions of the merger was that NBC affiliates had to partner with local nonprofit media organizations. In one case, I think it was a local radio station. In another case, it was ProPublica. In another case, it was Voice of San Diego. Uh, I actually don't know how that's turned out. I think it would be a great question to ask. Is like, what happened with that? I mean, I know on paper they did it, but I would love to know. Did it work out? Did it really? Was it good for the nonprofit entities? Did it really lead to more? Uh, you know, investment in the, in the community? If, if the answer is yes, that might point, might have some lessons for public policy issues, and similarly if the answer is no. I, that that might be a very interesting precedent, actually, you, that you're you raising. Yeah. I think it's an interesting point, too, because I think one of the reasons that that was an ability to have that as a condition in the merger, and I think it was volunteered by Comcast, was because they, in fact, had already gone down that road. With one, they, with, with one station, and they found it to be something that was a, a, a good model and thought that that was something that they could expand. So these are ideas that can be generated in the, uh, in the commercial space and can, can help to, uh, to create new ideas. I think that's a great one. But we do have to be careful with the trade-off, because we did allow one of the biggest media <laughs> mergers ever to happen in exchange for an interesting pilot program, which is indeed interesting. Well, I, I, don't, so. I don't think I, they yeah. viewed that as the trade. <laughs> I think that was probably I'm just saying, maybe a little bit of a no, I, would I would absolutely say, <laughs> even if it was a wonderful success, that wasn't right. a good enough reason. And, 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 and look, <laughs> I, I think that if we want to talk, though, about what public media needs, is it definitely needs investment. And we should yeah. be talking about you know, why we spend far less than any other leading democracy on our public media system, something like $400 million a year, about $1.50 per person. You know, in Canada, it's $27 per person. In England, it's 80. In the Scandinavian countries, it's $100 per person. I think if we spent $5 per person on public media, we could get a lot of interesting local news. We might combine that with some of these other revenue sources that Steve's talking about, and suddenly we've got some real money that we could earmark and commit to local journalism. I think that would be a, a great thing to explore, and we can figure out, there's a lot of figuring out to do. How do you spend the money? How do you make sure it doesn't just go to the incumbents? Uh, and actually encourage innovation, that's the kind of creative policy I'd love us to move toward uh, you know, once we can g get past this one. <laughs> I, I can't resist a shameless uh, a plug that uh, uh, Larry Kirkman at American University and uh, uh, we at uh, USC have been uh, doing a joint series of research projects for the last couple of years, which will keep going on uh, uh, exactly how public media, uh, <coughs> radio and television and online can fit in with, with commercial media. But that's, uh, and we found, I guess to our surprise, one of the first studies was that public radio is doing better than anyone thought and public television is doing much worse than anyone thought. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> interesting. Yep. Uh, who has the microphone now? I see, them. I see someone, someone waving someone, in the back. Someone in the shadows <laughs> in the corner. Yeah, so, Seton, hello? Ciao? Yeah, it's on. Yes. Seton Motley with Less Government. Um, two quick points. One, uh, if you want to wa watch a watchdog become a lapdog, have the government buy the dog food. <laughs> um, I didn't think there was too much room to Obama's left, but public media has found it. So I don't think you can get an o a lot of analysis of what government is doing if the government's paying the bills for the journalism. So that's, that's a problem with public media and public journalism. And second of all, the public interest is best served by what the public is interested in. And if local news gave, brought in a ton of money because a lot of people were watching it, They'd be running at 8 to 11 every night, seven nights a week. 
The reason they're not is because people aren't tuning in. So you might think it's a good idea, and I found it kind of a frightening authoritarian thought that we should dictate to stations that they broadcast and print what we think is important. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the audience gets to decide what they think is important. And believe me, if the stations and the newspapers were making money doing what you guys wanted them to do, they'd already be doing it. The fact is they don't make money doing that, and therefore you want to subsidize it and have the government pay for it and mandate that they do it. At the end of the day, the public interest is best served by what the public is interested in. If this stuff were get running gangbusters with the American people, it would already be happening. Well, yeah, I, you know, just a response to that. First of all, you can build uh, firewalls. Uh, I acknowledge that I, too, would be concerned about a direct connection between uh, journalists and, uh, and how, how things are funded. In fact, you can make, some make an argument right now that uh, public radio has actually made a, a swing to the right because of the pressure from uh, the Republicans that have made an effort to try to kill public radio uh, and public television. Uh, so, yes, I, I, share that, I, share, I share that concern. Uh, but I think there are ways for public's, uh, the public money to be invested in, in a public good like journalism without attaching conditions. Uh, if, it, if you do, though, have the only condition being uh, whatever is most popular without making any effort at local news, uh, then I think it would be all Britney all the time, and I'm not sure uh, <laughs> that's really a solution either. I, I mean, and I think the same argument can be, I mean, <laughs> look, first of all, the rest of the world has figured out how to uh, support public media and do quality journalism uh, without government interference. We can take the best examples from elsewhere and come up with a, a way to spend money that gets government further away from the purse strings, in fact, which is what we should do. Secondly, uh, the idea that people are just getting what they want. Uh, one, n local news operations are vastly profitable. Some of that has been done by, of course, getting rid of journalists, but they, they're making a ton of money, billions of dollars in this election year, as, as, as we already talked about. And so the idea that there, people are turning away because they're getting too much news or too much quality reporting from their local outlets, I think is completely backwards. And I think that they were probably, you know, yes, there are more things to distract them, but, you know, the outlets that are doing quality work are going to get eyeballs and look no further than NPR, whose numbers are rising, whose journalists, uh, they're hiring more journalists, they're opening foreign bureaus. Uh, and that seems to be something that we might want to emulate on the local level instead of running away from it. And, and domestic bureaus. There's a big NPR uh, investment in New Orleans right now uh, after the times picking you. On, on the philosophical point, uh, there, are, there are certain things that we call public goods, which are types of products and information that have broad public benefits that don't necessarily pay for themselves in a particular uh, commercial uh, economic cost benefit analysis. Uh, museums don't pay for themselves and yet society supports mu museums. A lot of what we refer to as accountability reporting fits into that category. When we were doing the FCC report, someone brought to us an example from Raleigh-Durham. Uh, the newspaper in Raleigh-Durham had done a series about the probation system being uh, broken and all sorts of murderers basically getting out of prison and, and killing people. So the newspaper spent six months on this, lost a huge amount of money. Not very many people read the article. Uh, a lot of the people who heard about the article hadn't even bought the newspaper. From a pure economic point of view of people will buy it if it's important to them, it was a total failure, that series. And yet, there are people walking around Raleigh-Durham alive today because they weren't murdered by the people who weren't pro, uh, who weren't paroled inappropriately because of that series. There are certain types of journalism that have broad public benefits to society as a whole, and yet which are not captured in, the, in uh, commercial uh, media economic models, and in fact that problem is getting worse. Getting worse because? Less well, less. from the disaggregation of content. Now, it used to be that uh, you know, that series never paid for itself. The foreign bureaus never paid for itself, but because the newspaper was a bundle, the stuff that was popular, the, whether it's the sports pages or the crossword puzzle or whatever, was cross-subsidizing the investigative stuff. That's now broken apart. You can just go to ESPN.com, get your box scores. They move 
and change as you're watching them, which is better than the newspapers. And, you, and there's no, <laughs> and there's no, uh, there's no cross subsidy. You know, newspapers can do that too. It doesn't have to be just ESPN. <laughs> you know, as, as we sit here in the museum, I feel compelled uh, in all of this discussion to, to mention that there is we continue to have a public good that's in the First Amendment. And at some point, you know, you can't let the discussion go to the point where it sounds like there's government either dictating content or uh, you, you have to remain, you have to retain that uh, journalistic freedom uh, and the ability to choose. And I, I think that's just an important value that I, I suspect we all agree with and, and ought to keep as part of this whole conversation. Do I see another, uh, is that, does Carolyn have the mic now? Yes. Um, so I, I run the Newspaper Association of America, so if you guess what my comments are going to be. I have to, but I do take, I have to, I, I take a little bit of offense, a remark that newspaper owners or media owners only care about profit. I mean, I, I, I think that's really not fair. Um, sure, they care about profit. They've got to care about profit. They have to, you know, pay salaries. You're absolutely right on the minority, the questions that we've talked about. I just don't think that it's too simple to suggest, in my view, that consolidation of ownership is a proxy for a lack of diversity. I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, and I think just to add to the, you know, we're going to fight these rules. You're going to fight for them. We know where we come out on these issues, OK? But what, we'll keep fighting them. But we should get together and talk about what we can do, because you know, we can do things that can be effective. And I, frankly, this is my own personal view, I don't think this is going to make a huge amount of difference. And sometimes I look at all this and say, all the money we've spent on this, you know? <laughs> in, this, in this media environment where people have so many choices, we're spending all this money on this where basically, you know, our lawyers are getting rich. <laughs> I, and I love you to death, but I mean, we should, we know we're not, I'm not going to convince you of your point of view, and you're not going to convince me representing our members, but I think we can get together and try to do something. Well, I mean, the, first of all, the question is always what can you have dialogue on and what can you work on together? Uh, we have met with uh, Paul Boyle of NAA recently, and we're, we certainly uh, are trying to find issues of commonality. Uh, I'm not here to offend uh, publishers, maybe to scold them a little bit, uh, but I would say that, uh, I mean, it, it is a proven fact, and, and broadcast sort of has its own economics, but in the newspaper industry for years, uh, the expected profit return was 20% and above. And, 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 and what I'm really trying to say, yeah. yeah. No, what, what I'm saying is it became a problem because the expectations, not just for the publishers, but for everyone around them, including the shareholders and what you know, Steve talked about with, uh, with public companies. Uh, so the question is, how can you just kind of create a different climate where people know that if they can just get through a period to get to the digital transition and accept 8 or 9%, it's more of a, of a criticism of American business in general that we're always looking at the next quarter instead of the next five years. Uh, No, and I understand. The current environment is horrific, and no one can argue over that. But not, not with all companies, because some of the companies, yeah, even, yeah. I mean, two or three years ago, uh, we, had book, we had companies that were begging us to look at their books. Uh, those same companies are now saying, we don't want to show you the books, which is actually a good thing, I guess, because it means they're making money. It also doesn't mean they want to necessarily share the revenue. But, but there is a, a soft kind of recovery happening in print right now very soft. It may not be maintained. Uh, and, and what we're still saying here, and I agree with you wholly on this idea that let's try to find things that we can work together on, even if we're going to disagree on some of the bigger points. You know what, we try to manage prayer and God will show Right. It, it's just, it, it's just the problem here with this particular policy, if, uh, and, and, and I'm not trying to be cynical about it, I'm just stating my own personal experience is that when these kind of efficiencies are created, Certainly in the last five to six years, for me, on a personal level, as someone overseeing the newspaper guild, all I've seen are massive job cuts. And I'd like to see something else, uh, is really what it comes down to. That's, that's my concern. And, and so if you f can find a way to corrupt me, to, to your point of view, uh, please do. 
<laughs> I, I think uh, that you should circle the date. Uh, what's the day? Uh, January 24 that we have Craig and Jane We're working ready. together, and now we have Carolyn and <laughs> Ernie working together. Uh, next uh, question or comment? I, I saw somebody with a microphone, I think, over there. No, in the back? There's yes, there's I see a hand. There. Straight ahead. Getting there is going to be tough. Yes, yes. <laughs> People in the aisles always have the easy uh, time. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> My name is John Boyer, and I'm with a new entity called the Media Stewards Project. Um, the question in my mind um, has to do, Hedrick Smith has a new book out, Who Stole the American Dream? One of his basic ideas in there is that American business has departed from what he called the virtuous circle of growth, where profits were shared in a more equitable way. I think this is an underlying issue here with the discussion today about what is the right level of profit for something that really is a public good. It's a real conundrum I, in order to try to figure out what this is. But Hedrick Smith, I recommend that to everyone here, this book, because he wants citizens more involved, more engaged. And one of the issues is how do you pay for this journalism that really does serve the public interest may not always serve uh, commercial interests. How can profits can be, be more shared more equitably with journalists and editors who need jobs like, that the local community needs? You know, let me take us in a weird direction as a response to that, which is I heard on uh, the radio, and I don't know, th I think it may have been NPR, uh, <laughs> the other day that uh, uh, they did a survey of where people get their news and who they trust. And they're finding that more and more of uh, the younger generation is actually thinking they get their information from internet sources and they don't really care whether it's true or not. Uh, and uh, it's, an, it's an interesting phenomenon to think about that uh, I had always thought that perhaps that where you really had the value for newspapers, for broadcasters and, and such is that we were the trusted source. Uh, the, the groups that could actually uh, say that we, we do, in fact, uh, check our sources and be able to, uh, to know that this is where it's coming from. And I think what you're finding uh, is that that isn't seeming to be as much of a value as it used to be, and that's perhaps affecting where, where uh, all of this is going, and we should perhaps have a conversation about that as well. One of the things that worries me about this particular moment is that we've had this, I think, uh, noticeable substantial uh, contraction in the depth of accountability reporting and yet it doesn't feel that way because we're awash in news. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't, you, if you stop someone on the street and say does it feel like we don't have that much, we don't have enough news? No one's going to say yes to that. We have tons of news. But when you look at the studies and, and common sense would tell you that if you, if you probe and say, oh, well, you know, a lot of these articles are based on two facts that came from the now bedraggled newspaper reporter who's the one left in the bureau, which is often what, uh, what is happening, you realize that there's a kind of core to this that is not going to be necessarily very obvious to people. Uh, the more I've looked at this, the more I think that, you know, to some degree it really is about body count in the sense that there needs to be a critical mass of journalists, full-time professional journalists, uh, doing this work. Uh, and I say this as someone who ran a web, started and ran a website. I'm a big uh, digital evangelist, and I think that the internet has created all sorts of tools uh, for doing journalism better. But at the end of the day, if there aren't enough people uh, spending full time uh, as a profession working on this, then everything else. Uh, it becomes a little bit like a Hollywood set where you have the facade, but there's nothing behind it. But in order to support that, you have to have industries that are able to have the profitability sustain. to be able to sustain it. And whether it's newspapers or broadcast, what you have to have is a structural environment where they can, in fact, make the, the profits to be able to pay for that journalism. And I think that's what it comes down to. I see a couple of hands. Uh, does anyone have a microphone? There's one in the back? Man, one in the back? Way in the back, in the shadows there. Yes, um, I'm, I'm Tim Robinson. I work for Congressman Bobby Rush. And uh, 
Uh, Congressman Rush has been uh, very vocal about uh, diversity uh, of ownership, diversity of content uh, amongst uh, uh, the different uh, <laughs> platforms, broadcasting, uh, digital, uh, and, and others. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, um, respond, I guess, uh, to, uh, to the comment that was made um, suggesting that uh, that this is much ado about nothing. Um, I think and, and, and I believe that uh, Congressman Rush would, would also share the view that for, for too long, uh, too little has been done uh, with respect uh, to these issues. Uh, sure, we can be ambivalent as to whether uh, or not uh, the effort that we're expending uh, will actually move uh, this needle or not. Uh, but I don't think we, sh we should be that dismissive because uh, the public interest uh, uh, is comprised of a complex of factors. Uh, I don't think any of us are suggesting that profitability should not be uh, a part of that formula. Uh, but there is something to be concerned about with increasing consolidation. Um, there is a lack of connectedness to communities that once existed when you had local business owners uh, that, that owned uh, the radio broadcasting property uh, or the television uh, station or, or the newspaper that served that community. Uh, and by allowing um, these rules to go forward without uh, more forethought, uh, more thinking out the box, uh, with respect to how we can move the needle uh, to uh, improve uh, diversity, uh, whether it's content, uh, whether it's diversity of ownership, uh, or, or whether we're doing more uh, to advance localism. You know, those are the things that, that we need to remain focused on. Uh, and, and, and we need to look at the marketplace uh, to see what what uh, influencers, what, what drivers can take us back uh, to that paradigm? Because I think uh, where we are now, uh, you know, just proposing rules without developing a record uh, that <coughs> um, substantiates the predictive judgments that uh, regulators are making when they're developing these rules you know, that, that's, that's not enough. And, and I think we, we, we just need to do more uh, to, to, to come up with new ideas. Um, uh, kudos to Dwight in the front. I think more needs to be done um, at these conferences uh, than is being done. You know, to have perennial, to, to have series on a perennial basis about lack of access to capital without anything more is, is not moving the needle. Um, I've said a lot. And <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a question? Uh, don't, don't give up the mic yet. Uh, uh, I know that many members of Congress have been signing letters to the FCC on this issue. Do you know if uh, Congressman Rush is one of those? Uh, yes, he has. Uh, but, but, but to be more specific, there, there, <laughs> there are different, different letters uh, being submitted um, and taking different views. And, and Congressman Rush uh, would uh, would, 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 would join uh, the chorus of members uh, who, who take the position uh, that uh, more needs to be done in, in, in terms of studying what the probable effects would be uh, if, if, if these rules in, in, in their current form uh, were to be uh, adopted by the FCC. Steve, what happens when letters from Congress come to the FCC? Uh, how seriously are they? I think they take letters from Congress pretty seriously. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I, I think this issue is an important issue, and, they're, and they view it that way. But I, I don't know what the response to the specific question is. I spent 26 years at the FCC. And uh, I can tell you they, they, they do, in fact, take letters from Congress very seriously and, and, and do take them into consideration. Let me say a couple things. One is uh, Congressman Rush has done a, uh, a lot of work on the tax certificate, and we should say thank you to him for that. That's been one of his 
initiatives that i think has been very important here but also i think that i'm a little bit i have to push back a little on the idea that there was much ado about nothing i don't think that was the comment that was made i think there was a comment the comments of indicated that we've all we all have a great deal of agreement on on a number of points and one of them is the importance of diversity of ownership and different ways of approaching that and different ideas of how you get there uh and i also take issue with the fact that uh with the notion that the commission doesn't have a record on this the commission has a very extensive record uh before it on the uh on on all of these rules and they've been looking at them uh over and over again since 1996 uh with the uh i kind of tell you i feel like it's deja vu all over again and many many times because i've been through this both from the commission side and from uh the the broadcaster side for a number of years so there's a fairly significant record uh and one that shows that this the the particular rules that the commission is focused on are not the ones that are focused on diversity but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the studies to move forward to uh, try to address the real problems. It's just just making an assumption uh, that rules that haven't changed in the last 14 years are somehow necessary to address a problem that you that the scene here is uh, is just not a correct one. And the commission should be able to work on the record that they've got. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I think the problem is is that in the repeated times that the court has sent these rules back to the FCC for their failure to consider the public input to for their failure to address they say diversity is a priority but then they don't explain how their changes are going to affect those rules and i i, I brought a little bit of the court decision because i think it's important because the court has said to the fcc despite our prior remand requiring the commission to consider the effect of its rules on minority and female ownership the commission has in large punt part punted yet again on this important issue <laughs> and that they re want to re-emphasize that the actions required on remand should be completed within the course of the Commission's 2010, because we're actually still in 2010 somehow, but 2010 <laughs> quadrennial <laughs> review of its ownership rules. So the court's been, I, I think, explicitly clear in saying, FCC, diversity is your priority. Demonstrate to us, uh, if you want to make these changes, what the impact on diversity is going to be, and yet the FCC has failed to do it. Now, the, the obvious solution, the one that I think Congressman Rush 47 other members of the House, 13 uh, senators have said is just do it, do the studies, do independent studies, make the case before changing the rules. And what they keep hearing back from the FCC through various leaks and other things is, no, we'll do it later. And, and I think we've been hearing for years and years and years, we'll do it later, suddenly we don't have the money, we can get to Davos, but we can't do the study. And I think that's what people are getting fed up about. <laughs> How many months does 2010 have? <laughs> <laughs> In FCC time. I, I think that one of the things that you have to, uh, let me just respond to that because it's really not quite fair to say. The, the, what the court said was that the commission needed to look at diversity of interest. Again, we all agree. I absolutely think that the, the commission has to look at that. That does not mean that every rule that they have is one that is specifically related to that diversity, minority diversity of ownership, there's no direct assumption. If the commission analyzes a rule and says this rule is not one that is uh, intended to promote diversity of uh, minority diversity interests, they can look at that and they can say that that can, that, that can change while they're doing the, the other studies. Now in the case here, I think that what some of the things that the commission's looking at, the purpose of the, my, of the um, uh, newspaper cross ownership rule when it was put in in 1975, was in fact to say that there should be a diversity of viewpoints. There was a concern that having a local newspaper that had control uh, in a community and, a, and combined with a local voice would have too much power. Uh, we've kind of flipped that in, in our current world. That it was never intended to be a, to promote minority and female ownership. It was intended to, to address the diversity of viewpoint. What the commission, the studies that the commission has done over time have looked at that issue and said, in fact, it appears that there's a better uh, relationship when in the community and better service to the community when you have some of these combinations. So saying you're relaxing that rule on, uh, on some level is not related to the issue that you're identifying from, uh, from the court case. And I think the commission can look at that and look at the records that it has before it and reasonably make some judgments. And I hope that they will.
I mean, I think if the FCC wants to say that diversity of ownership has nothing to do with diversity of viewpoint, they should be very clear about that. And then we'll go see them in court again, <laughs> because, because we'll have to go back to court again, as we did last time around, and, and have the Third Circuit set up. You should and look this, at the case law. And, and this case is the one you're, you're uh, This is Prometheus Two versus the FCC, yeah. uh, which was the, the case that overturned the changes made in the Republican administration uh, circa 2007. Okay. Um, I'm, at this point, uh, in the role of the moderator, asking who has the microphone, which is an interesting role. <laughs> No one has the microphone. No one has the microphone. Okay. We've, we've bored them to tears. <laughs> well, I see Mark over there on the side. <laughs> Mark is shaking his head. You've seen all of this. And you're a lawyer. Yeah. Come on, Mark. Because I'm a lawyer, I say that. Mark, come on, Mark. Please say something. And Mark has the microphone. <laughs> What I have to say is that we understand that Senator Sanders is actually on his way. Uh, so we are, uh, we are waiting uh, for Senator Sanders to come in because he did express some interest in speaking. Uh, I do not have an interest in speaking. Uh, but would love to hear more from the audience. I think this has been a, a very great and balanced panel. And I see that there's a, there's a young man up there. There's another one here. There are plenty of people who want to talk. My name is Pedro. Hi, <laughs> my name is Pedro Morias. I work for Fenton Communications. Um, I wanted to go back to the issue of accountability and I, the idea that a the shrinking number of reporters affects the uh, accountability in the news space was really interesting. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the number of owners uh, or the number of companies that own news stations and if that has any impact in your minds on accountability. Well, you may have the best I mean, I, 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 th I think it certainly does, and we've seen as we've allowed more consolidation, a shrinking of newsrooms, fewer reporters out there on the beat. Uh, we see it on television right now, something we sort of skated around, but these shared service agreements where stations are combining their newsrooms, producing one newscast that's broadcast on even two or three channels at, uh, at the same time, same news, same people, same coverage. I think if you have you know, multiple ownerships and competing newsrooms, you're more likely to get more of the stories that you, you would hope to see uh, as a citizen find out about, find out what's happening in your community. Certainly, if there are fewer reporters on the beat, you're getting less coverage. There's no question about that. I think the academic studies suggest, you know, uh, fewer reporters mean, you know, less accountable members of Congress, less corruptions exposed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would argue that consolidation has contributed negatively to that. Obviously, some of my colleagues might disagree. Um, but th that's where I would. This is a very confusing issue, and, and there's all sorts of facts that, just when I think I've come to my own mind on this, some new fact will come up that disrupts it. For instance, the fact that the golden age of newspaper investigative journalism happened at the period when monopolies were being created in local communities. That it was the monopolization of local newspapers that ended up creating such lush profit margins that they then invested some of it and invested, which is not an argument for monopolization, but it is an argument for this being, you know, sort of uh, some somewhat more complex and confusing. Another example is uh, certainly up to a certain point, having two newspapers compete with each other or two, news, or two TV stations compete with each other usually produces better reporting. But having nine stations instead of eight stations if that means that those nine stations are dividing up the advertising pool of that community thinner and thinner, and as a result, they, some of them may have less money to do reporting, uh, it, it is not the case, I, I don't think, that more voices in a community is always necessarily better. I mean, I certainly wouldn't say that taking it down from two to one, but when you're at the point of going from nine to eight, um, there may be situations where that's an improvement which I never would have thought uh, you know, before working on this study that I would have said, but I think uh, it's, it's a kind of a counterintuitive thing that we have seen. What about the situation where you have um, um, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, um, uh, well, WB isn't around anymore, but then your number six station, which may be number one, actually, your audience is Univision, and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, Telemundo, mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe uh, here in Washington, uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, a Korean language does very well. Yep. 
Uh, certainly, this is the case also in Los Angeles, San Francisco, other places. So, so th those stations seven, eight, nine may be addressing other niches with, it, with journalism. In, in the case of the Univision, uh, they are. But the FCC report, if I'm remembering the numbers right, said something like 25 to 30 percent of local TV stations do no news, do no local news. They do reruns in Seinfeld. And since I, I remember going uh, home one day from the FCC and railing against how outrageous it was that these local stations weren't doing news, and of course I went right to Channel 11 to watch the Seinfeld reruns, and I thought, <laughs> okay, that's a, useful, that's a useful public service too. So I'm not necessarily <laughs> saying that every station has to do it, but we should be aware that, you know, that not every station in a, in a uh, market is necessarily adding accountability reporting to the mix. But it's important that they are serving the, some local interest. You, the, what you pointed out, Korean programming uh, in, in this area and some of the other language, that I think there's a channel that has uh, Farsi as well, uh, that they're, they're serving a particular niche and that's very important too. And it is a matter of serving the public interest that ought to be recognized even if it's not a local newscast. And, and we're not happy to have the uh, Steve's quandary right now anyway. It really is <laughs> at this point about whether the one newspaper is uh, sending anyone out to cover the courts. Uh, David Simon, uh, who's well-known uh, co-writer of The Wire and some other things and a longtime Guild member uh, in Baltimore, uh, his famous comment recently is it's, it's a really good time to be a crooked politician. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he's right. I mean, essentially there are a lot of things, school boards, city councils, uh, I just recently learned of a big argument in uh, Trempeleau, Wisconsin, over fracking and, and some question about corruption uh, in a part of the uh, Wisconsin that is just never going to get looked at. I'm aware of it because uh, my, my wife's family comes from there. Uh, those are issues that are going to really be important, and I suspect that uh, in five or six years we're going to start hearing some uh, things that really shock us because they just basically got overlooked. So how we get there uh, and how we create sustainable news organizations is, is still, the, I think, the fundamental uh, issue. Paul. Uh, just continuing with this conversation, original reporting, accountability journalism is really expensive to do. You know, you've got to send a reporter down to City Hall, comb through records. It may take six months, a year. Uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel won a Pulitzer a couple of years ago looking at city employees who were uh, doing double jobs, you know, working for the city and working in the private sector, and, and uh, they had an employee go through records for six months. And, and so uh, we talk about ownership, we talk about the whole profit grab, but I think it's important to point out that uh, over the last five, six years, newspapers have lost 50% of their advertising revenues. Uh, and people often point to digital as being the answer, but for every digital $1 uh, brought in from digital revenue, $45 is lost in the print advertising revenue side. So digital is not the answer, largely because advertisers are buying audience, audiences across a lot of different websites through targeted advertising and that kind of thing. From our perspective, you know, we want to support the diversity initiatives that have been put out there by MMTC. And for the first time on this issue, since we've been working on it, we put in our, into our comments support for many of these proposals, which, which I think advance the ball significantly on diversity and gets at that ownership issue. Um, uh, but from the cross-ownership issue, the TV relaxation really doesn't do much because newspapers are not going to buy something outside of the top four. Newspapers are not going to get investment from companies that don't, don't do news outside the top four. The, the radio newspaper cross-ownership piece of that could provide the cross-subsidies from radio to newspaper journalism to continue to that accountability journalism that we talked to about, especially if you're in Ohio, <laughs> Virginia, <laughs> and any other swing state. Or, you know, you could see where that could be the ability to shift revenues from one side to the other. So I just wanted to point out the revenue part of this, which I think personally is the main thing that's driving, unfortunately, decisions to cut back on editorial and cut back on jobs. Okay, no question. 
I mean, we should ask a question, though. I mean, these guys, you could, we're making a lot of money before. And I, the, everything you describe are re very real factors in the industry. But I think there was a time of 40, 50, 60 percent profit margins and up. And, and, and yet the cutbacks were happening then, too, not to the degree the industry is changing. Uh, I, I think that there, there were things. And I think the FCC hasn't helped uh, in that uh, what happened was that they, there was a lot of consolidation. And so the problems of one company started spreading to another. And again and again and again, and all those huge profits got invested in taking on uh, other outlets. And now, and now everybody's drowning in the debt. So we, we have to look at, you know, I think largely or partly encouraged by what the FCC and other policymakers were doing. So I think now if we're going to solve that problem, I guess I question, although I would settle for let's study the impact because there's not that many uh, owners, uh, women owners, people of color owners on the radio side either, but let's go ahead and study that and see if there's some more flexibility versus TV. I think that's something we should certainly look at, uh, whether those always need to be tied together. Uh, and, you know, and, and furthermore, that <laughs> Uh, on, on, on the newspaper side, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think, I'm not surprised by Steve's statistic about uh, that period of time when the monopolies were coming into place. That's, a, that's the period of time when everything would have been most flush and people were still living under some of the old structures. I think when some of the corporatization sort of ran out uh, and then, of course, the overall economics uh, really went under. Remember, there were a lot of papers that were sold just before the crash of the economy. Uh, so there are a number of contributing factors, but we do know that uh, things like Craigslist uh, and uh, also paid search, Google's dominance in paid search and pulling advertising away from uh, even other, even websites, you know, where we can't replace that on a web because the money really is going to a different place. Uh, those are all factors. Uh, but, uh, but, but as we said before, there's some really exciting things that are going on, and can we then can we find a way to get to the new period um, without uh, sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Uh, and, and the jury's out. What I was going to say is that we should think about also how can we incentivize that good work that is happening. And I think Bernie's looked at that through, you know, are there ways to, if, if there are bankrupt companies, to package it in a certain way to encourage local ownership, to encourage minority ownership? Are there tax breaks we need to be looking at that would benefit the newspaper industry because of the role they play in local communities? I, th I think lots of those things need to be on the table. Uh, if, it's, if it's about supporting more reporters working, more people out there on the beat, I think we need to look, are, you know, are there other streams of money that could be put toward that? I, I think we should consider those things. I happen to think doing it through the FCC with consolidation is, is, is bad and it's going to have bad results, but it doesn't mean it's the only option. We've mentioned it briefly, and, and it should be noted that, uh, that public radio has become a major, major force in some local communities. Uh, I was stunned when uh, I asked the general manager of uh, uh, of the uh, NPR news station in uh, uh, Los Angeles, KPCC in Pasadena, uh, how many reporters he had, and he said 100. It's the size of the Baltimore Sun. It, it is. Uh, that, and that's uh, up from, I think, four uh, mm -hmm. not that long ago. Well, uh, you know, there's a couple things that <coughs> the public media world could do that would help, which are tough politically for their own reasons. One is they have a, uh, I can't remember if it's statutory or policy, they decree how much of the money goes to public TV versus public radio. And the lion's share goes to public TV, even though public radio is actually the one that is, is investing in local communities. And I think the Corporation for Public Broadcasting should have the flexibility to shift, the, shift that money more towards where it's needed and not be locked into an old standard. Similarly, they sh Currently, almost all of the money that CPB spends on public media must go to someone with a radio or TV license. If you're a nonprofit website, uh, or for that matter, a satellite TV show, mm -hmm. the satellite TV show, you can't be public media, but if it's going through the other kind of airwave, then you can. Uh, that doesn't make any sense at this point. CPB should be allowed and open and cr experimenting with funding a variety of public media, not just uh, radio stations and TV stations. I think they're looking at that. I know that the National Endowment for the Arts has significantly shifted its assistance <coughs> away from uh, broadcasting, uh, or not away from broadcasting, but they've reduced their broadcasting support. And they've put a significant investment now into uh, online uh, arts. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, There's someone there who seems to. OK, thank you. Uh, hurts the ability for people of color to get uh, access to capital. 
is there a correlation in your view, or do you think there's not a correlation the inability to, to get access to capital because the Saudi market? One of the, what, what I've always, yeah. Uh, the response is that you have to have a healthy industry, and you have to have an industry that can have uh, a certain scale, scale and scope to be able to be healthy, to have access to capital. And having that, whether it's some level of consolidation may be appropriate for that. Interestingly, in um, one of the things that uh, I, I was reminded of this a few minutes ago, Clear Channel, when you mentioned that Clear Channel had a lot of, uh, of, of stations in the market, uh, that they had been in consolidation. After the 96 Act, they were, because the nationwide cap on uh, radio ownership of radio was lifted, they got to a point where at one point they had 1,200 stations. Uh, most recently, they've been donating stations uh, to women and people of color, uh, that through the MMTC, they have an active program uh, where they're running the stations to be able to be sold. Uh, which is kind of an interesting thing, and, and having it, it's actually become a, a little bit of a, a means of itself on its own. I don't, I, what, I, what I respond to, I guess, is to say that you can't just say consolidation is this or consolidation is that. Well, Some know, aspects you know, of. I think having a healthy industry is good for everyone to get into it. What? Thank you. Money, um, m yeah, money politics, uh -huh. and um, and also the um, the population that we need to begin continue developing uh, the younger people who are going to our colleges and universities, and many who are not. The human capital factor, innovation. The president has talked about it. Innovation, which goes into technology, all of that is relatively missing now. The whole business about diversity, which you know is a moral, good moral argument, forget about the morality of it. Let's talk about the monetization of all this. The reason why the NAB is, on, is, is a major target right now over cable is because the NAB has to respond to Congress much more so than, than NCTA. So, so, so NAB is, is, is going to be on, on the tip. And NAB can provide the leadership and has provided the leadership. Let me just give you one idea that has, wasn't brought up. When you, somebody mentioned thinking out of the box, how process works to make things happen in Washington. In 1989, there were a large population of minorities who were producing content. These were independent producers locally in Hollywood and all that who weren't getting any kind of play. The NAB is not in the business of providing content. That, that belongs to NAFB. That's the marketplace. I went to Eddie Fritz, and I said, Eddie, we're doing a great job in ownership. NAB. You remember all that? Eddie was head of the NAB. Yeah, that Eddie time, Fritz yeah. was head of the NAB. All right, I, I said, look, we don't, we don't touch that. We don't touch content. We don't touch anything. That's Hollywood. That's like, anyway, I said, look, Mickey Leland, who was then congressman and very concerned about what was going on in broadcasting, and what was really going on with the NAB said, look, the NAB isn't doing anything for minorities. I said, Eddie, look, everybody wants to get into the business of making movies or making documentaries, public broadcasting, this and that and the other. Why don't we have at the NAB the largest form of its type in the world? And, and, was not as, and it wasn't as, as diverse then as it is now. I said, why don't we have a major a major showcase of minority programming. Minority produced programming produced by independents. Eddie says, you're crazy. He says, nobody, go to, go to NAFI. I said, NAFI isn't going to do it. We can do it. It isn't going to cost us a lot of money. Bottom line, we did it. Mickey Leland and two other members in the Congressional Black Caucus came. As a result of that, 35, and we were in a partnership, incidentally, with a lot of the public interest groups that are represented here today to include the newspaper industry and, and include uh, public broadcasting. Mickey Leland and three other congresspersons came to the NAB the first time ever, toured not only, not only the exhibition, and we had about 45 to 60 minorities, including Latinos, Asians, and blacks. And he was so impressed, he went back, he made a statement, uh, uh, and Congress, you know, you know, when they come in in the morning, that, uh, that five minute, he, he, praised, he praised the NAB for what it was doing. 
political kudos. We picked it up. We developed a relationship that later benefited us, the NAB at the time, in doing the other things that we do. Minority entrepreneurs benefited from it. And out of that came the first Asian American broadcaster, a guy named, named uh, um, uh, Lou, who is now one of the, the only Asian radio broadcaster in existence who is also in television in California. He was one of those originals who came to that, con came, came to that thing. So the, the whole point of the matter is that we talk about thinking out of the box. The NAB provides the leadership, has the form. I know that we have, I know the NAB has, we, we, we're going to have uh, something on, on management and all that and somebody will mention minority ownership on it, but that's not going to be the principal thing. We need, if you haven't done it already, just an idea, mm -hmm. and I know it can be done, a special form comprised of some of these people to talk about this issue because it involves a lot, a lot, and it's not going to be covered in a generalized broadcasting management panel. I know it isn't. Now, we can do it. If we don't want to do it, that's fine. You know. This guy standing over there who refused to talk, who is one of the most resourceful people, who's a former NBC, he's an NBC uh, uh, anchor, one of the first, and a lawyer, and is one of, the, one of the greatest people in what we're doing here. He can add a lot to what I've just said, and I brought him to the NAB when he, at the time, he had never been to the NAB. He says, no, they, they won't talk to us, they don't like us. Didn't you come to the NAB at my invitation? And I made sure that he met some of the kingpins at our VIP reception, and he went away thinking a little bit differently about the industry. So this sort of a thing, out of the box, can be done, and we can go around the circle talking about, you know, I understand the legislation, I understand the regulation, but it is relationships that gets the job done. Relationships. Dwight, so you have, Dwight, you have the I'll, last word. I'll, I'll use that as, as an introduction. Uh, <laughs> Senator Sanders is here. Uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, he has asked for an opportunity to speak on these set of questions. And uh, with that, Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Vermont, please. Thank you very much. I will be very brief because I've got, a, I've got some big votes coming up in a, in a few minutes. Um, for many years now, uh, all of you uh, are aware that there has been a great debate going on uh, about media consolidation. Uh, and the free press, among many other organizations, have rallied millions and millions of people to make the case that it will be a disaster when we have, in a given community, one large uh, multinational media conglomerate owning local television stations, uh, radio stations, and newspapers, and essentially being the only voice of information for that given community. Uh, some three million people uh, signed petitions and made comments in opposition to that proposal when it was brought forth uh, by the uh, Bush administration. And the news that I bring you, which I hope and expect that all of you know, is that unless we act very strongly and very effectively within the next few weeks, it will be uh, Chairman Janikowski's FCC, uh, which in fact brings forth those, that resolution. Uh, they have done it in a way which really, not only am I very bothered by the content of what they are doing, uh, but the process is also a disaster. They have really uh, tried to operate under the radar screen, uh, and uh, we are where we are. And where we are is there is a likelihood that within a next few weeks, very quietly, uh, that decision will be made. Uh, I am further uh, concerned uh, that a chairman of the FCC appointed by President Obama will do exactly what President Obama spoke out against when he was a member of the United States Senate. So the first point that I make is that uh, we have got to do everything that we can to raise consciousness about this issue and see if we can uh, defeat it. Second point that I make, which also uh, all of you are very familiar with, is that many people are not aware 
uh, that if you are concerned about the economy, if you are concerned about health care, if you are concerned about foreign policy, you must be concerned about the media. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Right now, everybody in America knows there is a great debate taking place about deficit reduction. And in my view, deficit reduction, given the fact we have a $16 trillion national debt, is a serious issue. Do you know what the American people consider to be far more serious, which gets very little attention? How many of you aware that real unemployment in America, counting people underemployed and giving up, people giving up looking for work, is close to 15 percent? For people of color, for young people, that number is much higher. When you ask the American people what issue should we be dealing with, you know what the issue number one is? It is jobs and the economy. Now, how often uh, do you hear that uh, in terms of uh, media? Not very often. Our right-wing friends have been able to set the stage that spending and deficit reduction are the major economic issues facing America, when in fact, recession, mass unemployment, decline in income, growing gap between the rich and everybody else is in fact, according to the American people, a far more important issue. In terms of media, if we're concerned about health care, how many people in this country know that there is one nation in the industrialized world that doesn't guarantee health care to all people? How many Americans do you think know that? When's the last time you saw that being discussed on uh, television? Um, I have seen time and time again media pundits telling us that we all know Social Security is going broke, don't we? Well, guess what? Social Security ain't going broke. It's going to be solvent for the next 20 years. But again, it is a right-wing agenda which has been incorporated into a lot of media dialogue. Here's the bottom line. Bottom line is that in 1983, 90% of American media was owned by 50 companies. Today, that same 90% is controlled by six multinational media conglomerates, that's GE, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, and CBS. And if these new regulations go into effect, uh, the amount of media being controlled by these guys will be even greater. So I uh, look forward to working with all of you uh, in making the point that a vibrant democracy is not going to survive unless we have a vibrant media where we hear different points of view, where it is owned by different segments of our society, women, minorities, etc. That a nation in which a handful of multinational media conglomerates control what we see here in Reed is a very dangerous situation for what many of us believe democracy should be. So that's the message. It's pretty simple. Uh, we've got a lot of work uh, to do, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Mark is always uh, shy to take the microphone. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm not shy. I, I am retiring. <laughs> Um, I think this has been an, an excellent program. Uh, I, I hope that uh, those of you who've wanted an opportunity to speak have had an opportunity to speak. Uh, this is an extraordinarily important issue, I think, both for our country. Uh, we really hope to have presented a, a variety of sides, not just two, but that you've heard from folks who are both owners of the industry and also folks who work in the industry, from newspapers, from broadcasters, from scholars, from uh, public interest advocates from a wide variety of perspectives about these sets of issues. It is not settled here. It won't be settled today. Chances are it won't be settled tomorrow. We do think the discussion is important, and uh, most importantly, we really thank your engagement in this discussion, and uh, really thank uh, USC Annenberg uh, and Adam uh, for really making this uh, this happen at uh, at the museum, and uh, an excellent panel, um, and uh, for Craig Aaron and Bernie Luntzer, and my friend Jane Mago, and of course Steve Waldman. Uh, please, uh, thank you all very much. It's a wonderful, wonderful. And thank you.